May I have your attention, please? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This hearing is called to order. This is the public hearing of the Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention. The purpose of this public hearing is to hear testimony on resolution number 170609. I am Councilman Kingada Johnson. I am the chair of the Special Committee on Gun Violence. I am also joined by my co-chair, chair of the Committee on Public Safety, Councilman Curtis Jones. Today we'll be taking testimony from the administration on resolution number 170609, which allows this committee to hold hearings on gun violence related topics. And with that, will the clerk please read the title of the resolution? Vanessa Garrett Harley, Richard Ross, David Perry, Cheryl Bedical. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to also acknowledge the presence of uh, my colleagues, um, Councilman Allen Dom, as well as Councilman Derek Green. The resolution is authorizing the creation of a special committee on gun violence prevention to address Philadelphia's enduring plague of gun violence by facilitating coordination among stakeholders and formulating a comprehensive gun violence prevention strategy. Um, before we start, I myself and my co-chair, Councilman Curtis Jones, will start with our opening statements, and I want to just um, especially acknowledge my colleagues who um, may not sit on the committee, but was invited to come and participate um, in this particular hearing, um, because um, as we um, have been seeing um, over the past couple uh, weeks, um, this is a serious issue that we need all hands on deck, all council members to be involved in because it impacts um, not only individual um, councilmatic districts but the city of Philadelphia um, as a whole. Um, I'm here today with a heavy heart. Philadelphia has been hit by a surge in gun violence and it has only gotten worse as the summer heat up has started to rise. Homicides and shootings are both up 10% over this time last year and the violence is more senseless than, than ever. People are being shot over petty beefs, sometimes as small as perceived disrespect on social media. Some people become targets by association, getting shot because they were spotted with someone in a photo, on a street corner, on a diss video on social media. We really hit rock bottom a little over a week ago when someone shot up a graduation celebration in a quiet street edge of the park in Southwest Philadelphia in the second councilmatic district. Six people were injured and one was killed. A mass shooting is what we call it that took place here in the city of Philadelphia. I wanna make sure that um, as a city and particularly as a councilman that we're aggressively addressing this issue. And I just wanna recognize that we made national news for the wrong reasons. Under these circumstances, Philadelphians don't feel safe and they can't feel safe. People are being shot in the streets. People are being shot in parks. People are being shot on playgrounds. Just this week, I heard from a constituent whose eight-year-old son was deeply traumatized by witnessing a close-range shooting right on their block. We can't allow people to be held hostage inside of their homes. This is a public health crisis, and we've reiterated this in past occasions. Past occasions, we are also in a state of emergency. It is times like this that citizens naturally ask what their government is doing to solve this problem. That's why we scheduled this emergency hearing of the Special Committee on Gun Violence. I established this Special Committee in 2017 to ensure that gun violence remain a consistent priority for the city of Philadelphia. I'm proud to say that since the Kenny administration has partnered with me and my colleagues to establish the Office of Violence Prevention and form a first ever comprehensive gun violence plan, we are moving in the right direction, but it's not enough. We need all hands on deck. I want to specifically say that uh, the administration has invested more than $30 million to address the issue of gun violence prevention over the next several um, years. 
But today is for all of us to look at how can we all strategize together and work as a team in making the city of Philadelphia safe. I want to specifically say this is not about who's not doing what. I want to specifically say again, this is not about who's not doing what, but how can we all step up to the plate and get involved and keep our young people safe, keep our seniors safe, and keep our families safe. Um, I'm going to open this also, um, early on, th this was a hearing specifically geared toward members of the Special Committee on Gun Violence, as well as the administration. After our panelists speak, after members of the Special Committee on Violence have an opportunity to give their testimony, we will open it up to the public. We will limit it to two minutes to have you give an opportunity to talk about what you think the solutions are. A lot of times we have these sessions and people come down and talk about what's not taking place and I can understand that because we all need to be held accountable. But this is an issue. This is an issue that's gonna take for everyone to roll up their sleeves to get involved in. Some people may say it's parental responsibility. Some people may say it's poverty. Some people may say it's the education system. The means is a complex issue, and it's not going to take one elected official. It's not going to take one government official to address this issue. It's going to take all of us to roll up our sleeves and find out how do we keep our city safe, but most importantly, how can we reduce the level of gun violence that we're seeing um, in our city? And at this particular time, I'm going to turn um, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Councilman Curtis Jones, who's the co-chair of the Special Committee on Gun Violence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to everyone who's out here today. Um, this is a passionate issue, and it is my opinion that everyone here has a stake in it, both in dealing with the problems on a day-to-day -day basis, but also crafting the solutions that short-term and long-term solutions that we face every day. Uh, it's official. It's summer. And according to statistics, statistics on open day, Philly, crime increases by 24% when it gets hot. In fact, there are indicators that suggest the hotter it gets, the more violent it gets. Uh, and that in between uh, the 2016 summer and the 2018 uh, summer, we've seen those 24% spikes in violence. Saturday, I had an opportunity to work with one of my mentors, Sister Falaka Fatal, on a documentary she was doing for the 70s anti-violence, uh, anti-gang war material. Although it was reminiscent and things change, and dialogues change, the more they stayed the same. If we closed our eyes and listened to what was being discussed, you could be discussing this about any hot weekend in the city of Philadelphia. One of the points that I want to get to today, things that I want to have discussed today, is number one, we took 72 officers off the streets, and how does that impact our plan to stem violence over the summer? These are real things that we need to discuss. Um, Deputy Managing Director Harley, in your uh, analysis over the 100-day plan that you um, put together, one of the options was using technology and cameras, live eyes on cameras, doing virtual patrols so that not only could we not just document crime and unfortunately death, but use them to prevent crimes by virtual patrols with live eyes working with boots on the ground, both um, civilian and police. We want to see how that plan can be furthered. Has there been a dialogue between the administration, the FOP, um, the Sheriff's Office to look at creative ways that we can move uh, non-uniformed uh, police to do traffic and things like that so we can put more police in hot spot areas around the city. The one thing that we all know is the best prevention of gun violence often can just be a job. And there are many people who passionately, some of them even this morning, talked about job options for at-risk young people and those opportunity young people, that's a new term they use, people that are between the ages of 18 and 24 who have a tendency to be at the heart of the problem. So as we approach the dog days of summer, I want to know how can we engage community organizations, elected officials, the administration to work together on some of these solutions. 
I understand we haven't done it with perfection in the past, but I hope that working together we can move forward to do it better to save these young people's lives. I'm looking forward to the discussions today, the answer to some of the questions that we can have, uh, and one of the things that um, Councilman Johnson and I do, and one of the things that these maps show is where these violent acts are happening. There's a geography to it. And if we know that certain spots are literally shooting and killing fields, if we know that, we can reverse engineer some of the solutions. And I'll show some of the maps where this is occurring a little later on. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Councilman. Um, I'm going to ask for uh, the clerk to please call up the first panel. Vanessa Gerd Harley, Richard Ross, David Perry, Cheryl Bedical. I'd also like to recognize our president, President of City Council, Darrell Clark, is in attendance as well. And also Councilwoman Cindy Bass. I want to acknowledge Councilwoman Cindy Bass before we start the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make really brief comments uh, based on Councilman Jones's uh, statement just a second ago, and I wanted to echo the comments um, he just stated in terms of crime during warm weather months. And for those of us particularly who are lifelong Philadelphians, it's not a surprise that there's an increase. This is not something that's new, but the levels of violence are just absolutely out of control, it feels. Um, but we've all seen this during warm weather months. And so I just wanted to uh, state for the record that we are in the process now of circulating a letter, and I believe that both of you have uh, joined on in support, um, and we're uh, talking to all of our colleagues now, but we are circulating a letter, a letter to the Parks and Recreation Commissioner asking for longer hours and structured programming uh, at our Parks and Recreation Centers. We know that this is not the end all to be all, um, but this is something that can be targeted geographically, Councilman Jones, as you mentioned. Um, this can be targeted geographically to particular neighborhoods so that where we know that violence is more likely to jump off, that we have some of these programs and activities in place to keep folks busy. We hear over and over again that they say, um, we don't have anything to do in our neighborhoods, we don't have activities, um, you know, and that is part of what uh, some folks feel leads to some of the concerns that we have and some of the violence that we've seen. So I just wanted to be on record to state that and thank you for your support of that measure. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilman Bass, and I thank you for your leadership um, in, the, in that area. I remember, and I've been doing this work um, for a while, so it's not about being an elected official as to why I'm doing this work. I've been doing this work as an activist for more than 20 years. And I remember we had the Beacon program where the schools were actually open all of across the city of Philadelphia from 3 to 9 p.m. to get young people off the streets. And so I thank you for your leadership in trying to find innovative ways for us to get our young people involved on the things that are positive. And with that being said, uh, whoever would like to start on um, the present their testimony first can begin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Johnson and members of the Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention. I am Vanessa Garrett Harley, Deputy Managing Director for Criminal Justice and the Public Safety Cabinet. With me today from the Office of Violence Prevention is Theron Pride, Senior Director of Violence Strategies and Programs, and Shondell Ravel, Executive Director. While every notification that I receive of a shooting informing me that a person's life has been cut short or irrevocably damaged because of gun violence in our communities is haunting, the last few weekends in particular have weighed heavily on my mind and my heart. So I want to thank you for calling this hearing and allowing me to testify regarding our progress on implementing the city's comprehensive violence prevention strategy, the Philadelphia Roadmap to Safer Communities, or the Roadmap as we refer to it. I particularly want to thank you for your continued leadership and impassioned advocacy to stem gun violence in our neighborhoods. I also want to express my gratitude to you for making sure that the fiscal year 2020 to 2024 budget that you recently passed included the additional $31.5 million of additional funding that the mayor allocated for the roadmap. 
When I came before you in March to testify about our strategy, I testified that the roadmap is a five-year comprehensive action plan to reduce and prevent gun violence in the city. It envisions that every Philadelphian will be safe from gun violence in their communities with full access to opportunities to create their path to a fulfilling life. Using a public health approach to address gun violence, we brought together multiple city agencies and partners, including police, to develop and implement the roadmap. We meet bi-weekly to review data, discuss emerging trends, and hear from police commanders and exchange ideas. The roadmap is not just a nicely printed report. It's a living plan that will guide us as we address the problem of gun violence over the next several years. The roadmap integrates evidence-based strategies that focus not only on apprehending the most violent individuals, but also on promoting health and well-being in our communities, especially among the individuals most vulnerable to gun violence. Most importantly, by using data and research from public health, police, and other agencies, and listening to people in the communities most impacted by gun violence, we have developed a better understanding of what is driving the violence in Philadelphia and applied that knowledge in the roadmap to implement what works to address the root causes of gun violence. The roadmap also lays out four major goals that places a special emphasis on the young people and places at the highest risk of violence. And I would like to highlight some of the progress that we've made within each of these goals since January. Goal one is about making sure youth, young adults, and their families at the highest risk of gun violence are connected to needed services and supports. Goal two is about strengthening our engagement in communities impacted by violence to better assist local efforts to address this problem. Goal three is focused on how improving how well city services and planning efforts related to violence prevention are coordinated. And goal four is about creating safer and healthier neighborhoods where people have an increased sense of safety and can thrive in the communities where they live, work, and play. Since March, when I first came before you, I'm happy to report that we have increased the number of available subsidized job training and employment opportunities and work readiness programs through 14 providers for youth and young adults at risk of violence with a $2.1 million investment of temporary assistance for needy families or TANF youth development funds that were made available to us through the Philadelphia Works. We have expanded the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership, known as YVRP, and we are working to expand the Community Crisis Intervention Program, CCIP, so that it can expand to more districts to connect and engage more youth, young adults, and their families impacted by violence to assist them with assessing needed services and supports. We've increased summer job recruitment for this year's Work Ready programs in areas where youth and young adults are at a high risk of gun violence and where recruitment in previous years has been low. And we started summer work experiences citywide two weeks earlier uh, than usual as well. We announced 47 awards for the Targeted Community Investment Grant Program as part of the first round of funding for community-based organizations working to prevent violence in their communities. Awards range from $5,000 to $20,000, and a total of over $700,000 was awarded. Continue to convene the executive implementation team bi-weekly that police, police Commissioner Ross and I chair to direct needed services and supports to the areas law enforcement has identified using crime data and the intelligence that they've gathered as part of the Philadelphia Police Department's Violent Crime Reduction Strategy, Operation Pinpoint. We have most recently begun focusing on specific hotspots or pinpoint areas in these meetings and bringing together other government stakeholders to see how we can be more precise and targeted with our resources and approach in these neighborhoods. In these meetings, we have identified the assets in these neighborhoods, and we are developing strategies around strengthening those assets, but we've also identified gaps in services and resources and trying to come up with ways to address those gaps as quickly as possible. With the additional funding that you have ensured us, we have been able to begin hiring for new staff for several key positions, including intelligence analysts for the police department, uh, injury prevention team at public health, and additional crisis workers for the expansion of the CCIP program. We have also begun to raise the profile and elevate reentry efforts in the city government by creating a new office of reentry partnerships in the managing director's office. We're also very committed to continuing our collaboration with you and the rest of our criminal justice partners to work quickly but effectively towards implementing evidence-based violent crime strategies, such as the focus deterrence model in Philadelphia. We have been speaking with State Representative Mavita Johnson-Harrell, 
as well as District Attorney Larry Krasner to make this a reality because we understand the urgent need for solutions. And more is to come. We are improving environmental conditions by cleaning, greening, and maintenance of vacant lots in neighborhoods with the highest risk of gun violence since February 23rd, 2019. 176 properties have been cleaned and sealed in these pinpoint areas. We're expanding the number of crew teams for the Community Life Improvement Program known as CLIP, using the TANF funds available through the Philadelphia Works Youth Initiatives to provide on-the-job training for young adults and to help with addressing quality of life issues in communities. As I stated earlier, the problem of gun violence impacts all of us. And while the problem of gun violence is very complex, this challenge is not insurmountable. The efforts and programs I noted above are all part of what we hope will be a lasting solution. There is no single answer. We can't police our way out of this, but I am convinced that the full scope of initiatives spelled out in our roadmap will make a difference. With the right strategy and tools and with all of us working together, I know we can reduce and prevent gun violence in our communities. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. We look forward to our continued partnership with this committee and city council. My staff and I, as well as others from the administration helping us to implement the roadmap are available to answer any questions you might have about our violence prevention plan. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Good morning, Councilmember Johnson and members of the Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention. I'm Dr. Cheryl Bettigal, the Director of the Division of Chronic Disease and Injury Prevention for the City of Philadelphia. I'm here to testify regarding resolution number 170609, authorizing the hearings to examine the plague of gun violence by facilitating coordination among stakeholders and formulating a comprehensive gun violence prevention strategy. I'm grateful for City Council's ongoing commitment to preventing further deaths and injuries from gun violence in our city. In the late 1990s, while working a shift in a pediatric emergency department, I was called in to see an infant who had been involved in a serious car accident. The car had been totaled. The parents, who were lucky to have survived, were terrified their th that their baby girl had been riding in the part of the car that was most damaged in the crash. I braced myself for the worst and went in to examine the child. What I found amazed me. The baby, who was still nestled snugly in her car seat, greeted me with a smile. I examined her carefully. She'd been completely unharmed. She didn't have a, a single bruise on her. Despite the wreckage around her, she'd been spared from injury, saved by her car seat and by the decades of prevention research that went into its design. When I talk to parents and grandparents who have lost children and grandchildren, spouses and siblings to gun violence, I think about that beautiful baby and about our failure to insist on the same public health response to gun violence that we have seen to the prevention of deaths and injuries from car crashes. We've made our roads safer, redesigned our cars to ensure they pass crash tests, and instituted strict laws against drunk driving. That is what the public health approach to injury prevention looks like. It includes environmental systems and policy approaches that change the context in which we fallible humans live our lives. As a city, we may feel powerless in the face of state and federal legislators who refuse to take action despite widespread support for sensible gun safety laws. City Council has passed strong local gun safety laws that could make a difference, but we desperately need the state to repeal preemption to allow them to be enforced. But there's important work that we do have the power to do and that we've committed ourselves to move forward. Firstly, we need to better understand the drivers of violence. What is working and what isn't? That means sharing data across city departments and agencies to look for patterns that might be amenable to change. If we identify those at higher risk and figure out which interventions are most effective for whom, we can start to make a difference. Those interventions aren't necessarily criminal justice approaches. If we could arrest our way out of this problem, we would have done so long since. They may be after school programs, jobs programs, behavioral health interventions, or other social supports. We already know that all known homicide perpetrators in 2017 had a history of a felony in the past 10 years. We need to know more, though, about how those who committed violent acts compared with those who didn't, in terms both of their risk factor exposures and the social supports they received. In other words, we need to identify the interventions that work and commit to scaling them up. 
ensure our highest risk residents receive the interventions they need. And we need to figure out if some of our current interventions aren't effective and stop doing them. Toward that end, we've been working to build an injury prevention unit focused on the prevention of gun violence within the public health department. I'm happy to announce, I'm really happy to announce, that we are hiring Dr. Ruth Abaya as our injury prevention program manager. Dr. Abaya is a pediatric emergency department physician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a fellow of CHOP's Violence Prevention Initiative. She is passionate about the prevention of gun violence through an evidence-based, community-informed approach. We're also working on hiring an epidemiologist who will be embedded with the police in the Delaware Valley Intelligence Center, working on analyses that combine police and criminal justice data with health and human services data um, from the, the CARES registry. We're grateful to the police for their willingness to partner on a public health analysis of our shared data sets. We're also working on setting up a firearm homicide death review that will take a deep dive into the circumstances that lead to gun homicides in our city and bring stakeholders together for in-depth discussions of homicides and ways they might have been prevented. And we're working on funding to expand our evidence-based anti-violence media campaign, You Shoot, Now What? This campaign was piloted through a collaborative effort of the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, the Managing Director's Office of Violence Prevention, the Philadelphia Police Department, and the Philadelphia Anti-Drug Anti-Violence Network, or PAN. The campaign hired participants from the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership to help disseminate information designed to start thoughtful conversations about gun violence. 60% of people shown the ads agreed or strongly agreed that they would be less likely to carry a gun after seeing the campaign versus only 30% of controls. And 71% shown the ads agreed or strongly agreed that they would be more likely to walk away from an argument after seeing the campaign versus 34% of controls. We hope to do a large-scale expansion of this grassroots campaign in high-violence neighborhoods across the city based on this evaluation data, and we're currently working on obtaining funding for that effort. In the short term, though, we've reprinted campaign materials, including resource information about the city's jobs hotline, GED and college educational opportunities, and anti-violence hotline information, and these materials are being distributed through the efforts of community partners. This is only the beginning of our work. We're committed to making real change through an approach that recognizes that hope and opportunity can be public health interventions, that every child in our city deserves a full and satisfying life, and that our job as public health professionals is to figure out solutions that work and implement them. We look forward to working with City Council to help implement these solutions to build a future not marred by gun violence. Thank you for the opportunity to, tes to testify. I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Told by Vanessa Garrett Harley, she wanted uh, Commissioner Perry to go next. Oh yes, go ahead, saying? Commissioner Dave Perry. Good morning, Chairperson Johnson and members of the Special Committee on Gun Violence Prevention. I am David Perry, Commissioner of the Department of Licenses and Inspections. Today I'm here to provide testimony regarding resolution number 170609. The Department of Licenses and Inspections will be leading the administration's effort to identify and remediate blight in sections of the city that are experiencing high rates of gun violence. Multiple studies, including research recently completed by the University of Pennsylvania and Columbia University, indicate a strong correlation between blight remediation through cleaning and greening and a reduction in violent crime in the targeted areas. The administration is proposing a four-part plan which includes the following components. Number one, sealing of vacant properties. Number two, demolition of unsafe and imminently dangerous buildings. Number three, cleaning, greening, and fencing of vacant lots. Number four, the creation of faux window and door treatments on abandoned buildings. What makes this effort different from what we have historically done is that number one, our program will be tightly focused on discrete areas where gun violence is highly concentrated. These target areas will be identified by the police department and an analysis of crime statistics. Phase one of the initiative in fiscal year 2020 will be completed within a 1.5 square mile area 
that represents just 1.1% of the land mass of Philadelphia. Number two, in contrast to our traditional complaint-based reactive response, we will systematically seek out and proactively identify specific locations where interventions are needed. Our budget is modest, but we believe that focusing these new resources within targeted areas will significantly improve the quality of life and foster a sense of neighborhood empowerment, security, and control. These are necessary components for crime reduction. The budget for fiscal year 2020 is $1.75 million, and the total budget is $6.26 million over the five-year life of the plan. This budget will support the hiring of an additional seven-person clean and seal crew dedicated to this project, 20 additional positions for CLIP, and an increase in demolition funds. We will also coordinate with partner agencies, including streets, parks and recreation, and the water department to bring additional resources to the specified areas as needed. As we are seeing with the Philadelphia Resilience Project in the Kensington area, coordination across city agencies increases impact. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's testimony. I'll be happy to respond to questions at this time. Thank you, David. Commissioner Ross. All right, good morning, uh, committee uh, chair and uh, also committee personnel. Uh, I am joined here today by several members of my staff, uh, including but not limited to First Deputy Patterson, uh, Deputy Commissioner Sullivan and Wilson, Chief Inspector Holmes, Dales, Kelly, Benor, and McDonald, as well as uh, some civilian members uh, here because of the level of commitment that we have to this issue. If it is okay with you, you have my uh, testimony. I will summarize in bullet form and then, you know, so as to allow you more time for questions if that's okay. All right. Yes. So, as was mentioned by uh, Vanessa Garrett Harley, Pinpoint is our uh, policing plan that we've uh, implemented, uh, which is a plan which uh, integrates hotspot policing and intelligence led policing and leveraging other city resources in order to impact particular crime ridden areas. Uh, at present, uh, this uh, program started in seven districts, um, and uh, we obviously plan to expand it. Our initial analysis year to date indicates that in those pinpoint areas, we've seen a 20% decrease in shooting and homicide victims. But however, that is juxtaposed to the 8% increase in the other areas that is not covered by pinpoint. Uh, so clearly, as we look to phase it in, there's some optimism about uh, pinpoint and the successes that we've had so far. But again, you know, these are not panaceas and never, nor will we ever suggest that. InfoShare is a program, an analytical program that uh, we were able to acquire uh, with the help of our police foundation. Uh, we talked before at our budget hearing about how, quite frankly, as a department and to some extent the city, we're woefully behind from an infrastructure standpoint technologically. It's not anybody's fault. This dates back for years. And so there are departments much smaller than ours that have had uh, significant analytical capabilities that we have not had. Uh, analytical capabilities like InfoShare that we do now have that will enable us to pull multiple data uh, systems together so that we can analyze things in seconds as opposed to having officers go through 10 different data points to try to figure out what's going on. So we have that system now. Uh, we've got it in place. We've got 400 that are trained. Right now it, it enables us to have greater access uh, to data as I've mentioned. Uh, in addition to which, uh, we've got 23 new gunshot detection uh, systems. It, it is not shot spotter. It is something that we believe is a little bit better. It's uh, something called Sentry because they're connected to cameras. And the idea is that that camera will pivot immediately uh, to uh, the sound of gunshots. It is also a belief by my experts that this system is, is better able to distinguish between an actual gunshot and a truck backfire, which is critical because you don't want police officers racing to those types of scenes, not only wasting time, but potentially putting themselves in harm's way. But we believe these systems will help as of, uh, in, or as of uh, September of this year, we believe we will add 27 more. Look, the only problem with these systems is they're an after the fact issue, but these are systems that obviously many departments are going to 
in advance of any questions about uh, shot spotter. Shot spotter uh, is an extremely expensive uh, cost endeavor. Uh, and as I understand it, it also requires that the systems or the cameras be contiguous to one another, which is not necessarily our issues as our problems are spread throughout the city in different hot spots. Um, Vanessa mentioned uh, the analysts that we are hiring. Another issue where we have been woefully behind on, and civilian analysts are typically trained uh, in academia to do the work of analyzing things that quite frankly, police officers have not been trained to do. We've got uh, dynamic police officers who you give them a task and, and they'll do it. But quite frankly, it's not the uh, thing that they were trained to do. So. Uh, civilians bring some great uh, insight uh, to issues. Uh, we've got some great ones here today. Uh, Kevin Thomas is just one example, and there are many, many others who are able to look through a different set of lenses, you know, to analyze data uh, from a high level 10,000 foot view without any preconceived notions that sometimes we do have as a result of our experience. Sometimes you, a great deal of what you see depends on what you're looking for, right? And so that's not always a good thing. And so sometimes when you have folks that are looking at things differently, it will help you. Um, one of the things that we're doing that we did mention is extended tours going into the summer. Um, for example, Highway Patrol and Narcotic Strike Force and multiple uh, district personnel are working extended tours, particularly on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, typically those uh, units were working either four to 12 or six to two. Many of them have been extended to three and four o'clock in the morning. It's a, a way of leveraging additional resources, which is something that we uh, desperately need. Uh, we've had several narcotics initiatives uh, throughout the city, which have resulted in multiple gun seizures. Now, this is not gun arrests of individuals carrying guns on the street. It's, that's a separate category. These are as a result of search warrants uh, that were done as a result of uh, probable cause and you hit houses for narcotics and multiple guns have been seized. The gun seizures are up significantly just in that arena alone. Um, multiple arrests have been made for narcotics violations in an effort to stem the tide of violence as we certainly, I don't think very many people try to deny the connectivity between guns and drugs and the violence that sometimes will result from it. And so that's one thing. You've heard me mention in addition to that, the number of arrest for what we call VUFA, which is violation of the Uniform Firearms Act um, for people carrying guns illegally without a permit on the streets of Philadelphia. And I've used uh, 2015 and juxtapose those two years, year to date versus 2015. And we literally have double the number of arrests that we've had then, which, you know, in one way speaks to the commitment and the intelligence that we need to target the right people because what we want to do is precision policing. We don't want to hit everybody with a broad brush. We don't want to get out there and start uh, creating friction in neighborhoods that we're trying to build relationships with. But the downside of it is on some level or another, it does speak to a willingness to carry more guns on the street, which is troubling. And so these are things that we're looking to examine to try to get our arms around why that's happening. Uh, Gun carrying in Philadelphia certainly is not a new thing. It has always been a troublesome thing. It has been an issue in my 30 years on this uh, job so far. So what, what is even more concerning than the number, and, and I don't want anybody to be offended by what I'm about to say, because people who follow the numbers know that they are always very concerning. We're not setting records, but we should maintain, as you said, a, a commitment, ongoing commitment to this issue. Um, in fact, in 2012, we have 20 more murders than we have today, you know. So, but the issue is one that we should stay on our radar every day, all the time. It shouldn't be when we reach some artificial threshold that we believe is unacceptable. It should always be unacceptable. Behind these numbers are people. People have families that are devastated by what they see each and every day. And it's not just the carnage that impacts the actual victims. It is the carnage that is created from young children that have to witness this, that should never see this, from families who are worried about uh, bullets that are flying down the street, from innocent victims. If you look at the incident this happened the other day in the first district in South Philadelphia that started with a domestic incident inside, stabbing, that ends up with three people shot none of whom were involved in that incident, as far as we know, including the decedent. 
And then there's immediately after that, well, let me change that phraseology, an hour and a half or so later, right around the corner, not 50 yards away, with police cars right there, a gentleman or someone pulls up and, and kills a gentleman standing right there, you know, without any regard for the fact that there were multiple police cars, news cameras that were on that block, which was immediately around the corner. And this speaks to the brazen nature of some of the people out here willing to commit violence. The issue at hand today is that we have to make sure that we don't unduly incarcerate people for nominal offenses and things that really don't make any sense. We don't have an interest in the police department and filling up jails and putting a bunch of people in jail for things that really are insignificant or minor in nature. But there are people, by virtue of the nature of the acts they're willing to commit, that belong in jail. And that's just a reality. And as a city, we've got to come to grips with that. And we've got to make sure that they are removed from the streets so that they are not able to harm people who are just going about the business of raising their families and doing what they have to do. Just very quickly, and I'll end, Councilman, you asked about the, the, the police officers on the street. Clearly because of that issue, and I don't want to venture too far down that path about what that was about, we felt that that is such a profound and devastating, uh, has a devastating impact on our brand and our, our reputation that we have to do what we have to do in the short term until we can get our arms around where each individual is relative to the infractions that they may have committed. As a result, some of those folks will be returned after they get the requisite diversity training and, and, and things like that, but we have to take those actions, and we do believe by virtue of the fact that many of them are spread throughout the department, some of whom weren't even in street duty in the first place, uh, that we are able to deal with that. But clearly, as I've said in a press conference, we always want more police officers anyway, so the notion of does, does it impact us? Sure, it impacts us, but we, it doesn't have the impact that it could have otherwise had. had it really hit one district or one division. And that's, I'll just open it up to your questions right now. Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge um, the presence of my colleagues, Councilman Mark Squiller, um, Councilman Maria Kiona Sanchez, Councilwoman Helen Gim, and Councilwoman Sherelle Parker. I want to thank all of you for being here at this very critically important um, hearing. Uh, I want to let, um, but before I turn it over to, to Councilman Curtis Jones to begin asking um, his questions. One thing I wanted to follow up on, um, Commissioner, um, I've reached out to uh, Rob Wonderling from the um, Chamber of Commerce and uh, will soon be speaking to um, David Cohen as well um, regarding looking at um, how can we engage in a public-private partnership um, with the Philadelphia Police Department when it comes to um, the philanthropic support um, a lot of times Philadelphia is compared to New York and how New York has reduced um, their level of gun violence. But when we talk about resources, right, um, similar to New York, also in Chicago, the business community put up um, more than $100 million to support um, those individual police departments to help build their infrastructure and also um, outreach from a support standpoint. And I took your comments at the last hearing seriously and decided to start looking at, um, again, how can we be supportive from a council standpoint to step up our efforts um, to address this issue? Um, but when you talk about Operation Pinpoint, you said it's in seven uh, police districts across the city of Philadelphia. So I wanted to under, get an understanding of um, how are those districts um, picked, uh, what districts are they, and when we look at expanding uh, citywide, what's the timeline um, based upon the current condition of violence that we're seeing here in the city of Philadelphia right now? So first of all, thank you for engaging the business community. And uh, you're right that our colleagues, uh, many of whom I was just with in DC along with the DA on Monday, uh, have uh, very vibrant police foundations. We've got a great one. Uh, but uh, even that foundation that we have is trying to get uh, the bigger dollar um, donations from their, um, from business. And so uh, cities like Chicago, like you said, have been able to get donations that have helped uh, the departments, uh, particularly with issues relative to analytics, which is really the wave of the future. If you were to ask me today, first of all, any police chief would always want more personnel, but I would actually pause and say that's not my ask right now. My ask is for uh, dollars that would enable us to purchase analytics, even beyond InfoShare, that will enable us to do our job better and faster. 
and, and that's the name of the game. So uh, thank you for following through on that. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that those conversations will help. The pinpoint districts were selected because of data, because of the areas, and we, we, we could have picked any number of areas, but we wanted to make sure that we covered all six police divisions, so we have at least one from every one of the six police divisions, and we're going everywhere from the 12th to the 22nd, we've got the 35th, we've got the 24th and the 25th, we've got the 15th, and so forth and so on, to, to add up to seven. We want to move forward, um, very short order, and, and we're going to move uh, at least to the 39th. We want to move ultimately to the whole city, but we want to do this right. Can't just move quickly and say that you're somewhere and knowing that you're not really supporting the plan and you're just saying you're there, you know, because this is a multifaceted approach. It doesn't just involve us. It involves other city agencies, but even relative to uh, police resources, we want to make sure that we're where we're supposed to be. And some of the data has already indicated that we are. Um, we are firm believers in pinpoint. We believe it's going to help us, but as you've indicated, there's not going to be just one magical solution for this. Um, we've seen these numbers ebb and flow um, over the years, and, and what we've got to do is a little bit more than just even a police plan. We, we've got to start at uh, the beginning and, and even have some tough conversations that people don't want to have, you know, and uh, I'm going to leave that for somebody else for the moment and stay in my world. But it, it's certainly not just going to be about policing in, in terms of getting our way out of this. And I'm talking about precipitous declines that just don't go from one year to the next. And then you go three years later and they spike again. We're talking about having Philadelphia get to a point where we can move this needle and keep it there and save these lives and save these families. Let's talk about the homicide rate. What's the current clearance rate right now? It's just 52 point, I think, eight, so it's just about 53%. About 53%. And right. what are we doing, um, you know, obviously from a personnel standpoint to make sure that we're, we're closing as many cases as possible, but also, and this issue is very near and dear to my heart because I do a lot of victims of gun violence, um, the parents, um, the fathers, um, the siblings. And how are we going about also uh, is there any strategies or initiatives that come with building relationships inside the communities to help individuals feel more comfortable of coming forward um, with information to help clear the homicide rates? Sure. So first of all, with regard to uh, what we're doing internally in the homicide unit, we had added upwards of 11 or 12 homicide detectives to uh, ensure that you, you keep a caseload that's manageable. Um, and, and there's some national figures, some say no more than six to seven per detective, and, and you want to keep it in, in that realm. Uh, but making sure that they have the requisite equipment that they need. Um, we did a little in, in our rather old building. Hopefully we'll actually be in the new one by the end of next year or the following year. But, you know, we've provided some more space for them to work in. Uh, but with regard to building relationships, that's an ongoing uh, thing. That's not one thing that we choose, one plan, one endeavor, uh, one outing. This is ongoing in, in all of our 21 districts. Uh, all these <coughs> folks are encouraged uh, to develop these relationships, and we've, we've got some really good ones. But I will not deny the fact that there are neighborhoods that we've got some work to do. Um, there are some where you can go in a particular district where, you know, three blocks that are adjacent to each other, they've got a great relationship. And then you go to the next one and they don't quite feel the same way. And so it's, it's a building block process. It is not easy. Um, but, you know, there are things that are being done that are beyond and outside of the scope of policing that I would argue are doing just that, that also are helping folks in the city. You've heard of our jobs program, where I believe the last number is uh, 62 or more people were now employed as a result of a jobs program that Southwest Philadelphia had started. That's, that's uncharacteristic of a police department. It's, it's not even, quite frankly, within our purview. We support it because it's just one effort to move the ball forward, in addition to which, and sadly, it did not get covered, and that might be our fault, uh, that uh, on City Line Avenue on Friday, I was there. Over 30 people got their GED on a program that was started by the police department, Southwest Philly again, in conjunction with OIC, you know, and it was nice to see folks, most of whom had been in, uh, in the system, that was one of the criteria, 
And so to see them and their families and how happy they were. And these were, uh, this was an endeavor that a lot of people don't realize in addition to the partnership, in order to even have that graduation, a lot of those police officers came out of their pockets uh, to actually help pay for that, you know. And there's a district out there, the 16th, that actually has a SAT prep program in conjunction with Villanova University. So there are a lot of things being done all across this city some of which do not get highlighted and celebrated. Some of that is not anybody's fault. It's just sometimes it doesn't get covered and sometimes we don't do a good enough job of telling our story. But I'm saying that to say that there are a multitude of things that we do to build relationships, but with the acknowledgement that you can never assume that you've arrived. It's always something, you know, and, and arguably we had something just recently that, that was a tremendous setback for us. And, and I don't think, Anybody in this department who's got any sense would ever try to suggest anything other than that. And I'm going to turn this over to Councilman Curtis Jones. Who, who, who would be, I guess I would call it, chief and community engagement person that represents the Philadelphia Police Department? Or is there, is there, is there such a position? I know you have traditional policing, right? And then also when you're doing a lot of out-of-box work that goes beyond policing, such as um, the jobs initiative, the GED program, like, is there one particular person that helps deal with community engagement separate from yourself being CEO of the police department? So I'm, I'm going to give you a yes and a no. The, 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 the no is that everybody is tasked with doing that, particularly people with rank. And, and you know, we, the reason those programs were started is because I believe those uh, commanders knew of our mantra to go do what you got to do, provided it's obviously legal and it doesn't, you know, conflict with any ethical issues and clearly they don't. But the yes would be, would be Inspector Altavis Craighead. Yeah, and so she's now the commander of community relations, a centralized unit, and uh, she's done some very good things, but we don't want to rely on one person to do that. You know, the, the aim is to have as many people as possible engaged in building relationships and not just put that on the shoulders of one individual. Thank you, Councilman Curtis Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the other day I was coming uh, through my district and one of the officers of the 19th was posted up on an island on Market Street doing free haircuts uh, for people who uh, were homeless, people who were having job interviews, people who wanted to, and most of them were men, uh, and I wanted to make sure that on the flip side of the coin that a lot of those activities go un unheralded and done. I mean, we've had uh, in our intervention basketball leagues, officers volunteer to be referees. Uh, and so we appreciate that kind of constant input and community engagement. So I want to say that on the record, that it does happen. It doesn't get a lot of press about it, but it does happen. And Thank I wanted you. to say it on the record. Thank you. And we're thankful. A couple of questions. Uh, Commissioner Perry, you talked about some of the efforts to do clean and seal, vacant lots. How much of that can be subcontracted out to locally based community groups that can do that same work, clean a lot, do some of the uh, uh, infrastructure of, of, of nailing up or, or build, uh, boarding up a vacant property. How much of that economic benefit can we give to some of the young men and women that might want to do that work honestly? That's a good question, uh, Councilman. Uh, what we have available, both through LNI and with CLIP, there'll be opportunities for folks to uh, come on as temporary workers and perhaps transition into full-time, full employment city workers, at least with the department licenses and inspections. And CLIP hires a lot of folks directly, so there will be employment opportunities. We believe that if we can do the work ourselves and can, and can control it, that we'll get a, ultimately get, get the best and most efficient product that way. So we're looking at at employing people directly as opposed to subcontracting out that work. So, so that is probably true on a cost-effective dollar-for-dollar basis, but we also went to a model in procurement called Greater Value, what was it? Mm -hmm. Best Value. Best Value, right? And Best Value to me is if I have a young man or woman fixing that house, there's a certain degree of 
responsibility and pride that comes with that so that we don't get it broken into time and time again because some of your clean and seals are multiple uh, closings because someone just took the liberty of tearing off mm -hmm. what they did and then went back in. If you engage some of the local groups to do that, a part of that charge is that we're gonna make sure it stays that way. And I'd like us to explore that possibility as a part of, of your engagement plan. Um, the second thing with that, I mean, you don't do it, I get why you don't do it, but let's look at the possibility of increasing our vision. We wanna do in, in my district a handy person program where we actually take young men and women that are high risk, those opportunity youth, and put them in a training program where they can actually get some practical experience that leads to a job either with the city, either with the union, or to be entrepreneurs themselves. So we wanna look at how we can plug that and remediate some of the vacancies in uh, trash-filled lots. So I'd like to explore that cost effectiveness. Um, Deputy Managing Director, of the 31 million mm -hmm. that we're putting out there, there was a figure, I think, around 700,000 that is going to community-based organizations. Is that correct? There was a total of 700,000 that we just uh, gave out to over 47 community-based organizations for grassroots work that they're doing. Can you give some description of some of that type of work? Sure. So the awards were between 5,000 and 20,000 was the maximum number of awards, and those numbers were just based on sort of dollar amounts and trying to spread it across um, as many uh, folks as we could. Um, and it went for everything from um, what you would think of when you think of a traditional prevention plan uh, in terms of uh, trying to come up with programs that would take young people off of the street and give them something constructive to do uh, in terms of uh, recreational or sports related activities to programs that are actually doing a hard level intervention on the street um, some of them are folks with, I call it lived experience, but that have criminal records or other things, but they have credibility in the neighborhood and are actually working with uh, the young men in the neighborhood. So it, it ran the gambit uh, across those 47 programs. Now we gave special consideration to programs that would hit the target population that we identified in the roadmap, which are men and boys of color, ages 16 to 34. We tried to particularly look at those programs that could hit that more high risk of offender. Uh, when we look at the array of programs in the city, what we have been able to notice now is that we do not have a lot of programs that hit the highest risk offenders or for that older age range, uh, the 25 to sort of 34 year olds. So we did give some, tried to give some deference to programs that directly impacted uh, those areas. So as we start to think outside of the box, again, if we can give subcontracting opportunities to community-based organization, that creates a job. But in the upcoming year or so, we're going to be dealing with census data and collecting that from middle neighborhoods to some impacted neighborhoods. Can we create a relationship with the U.S. Census Bureau to make sure that some of the uh, areas where they might be a little resident about going into, that we can get folk who are familiar with those communities recruited and moved in there because it helps us on uh, community block grant dollars as we count and get a full count of folk that are boldly go where some folks are afraid to go. And so, so they have a unique uh, kind of qualification that they can get into these hard to reach, harder to reach neighborhoods. So if we could kind of plug that in. Um, you talked about summer job increases. Can you tell me from what level to what level the last I heard, there were 10,000 summer jobs that the city and uh, our stakeholder organizations had, but there were 18,000 requests for work. How close are we to bridging that gap? I, to be honest, do not have those specific numbers here today, but we can certainly supply them to you, and we'll get them from the Office of Workforce Development as well as, as, well as our Work Ready programs. I can tell you that the additional two, 2.5 million that we've received from TANF funds 
Uh, we work closely to make sure that align directly with this violence prevention kind of strategy. And that again, we're trying to target those higher risk folks or folks that we have not seen by doing the roadmap and us coming together at the table of various city agencies, we've also tried to target and make sure as we look at what resources are in what neighborhoods that we made sure that special recruitment efforts were done in the areas that are experiencing the higher risk of shootings and uh, homicides and have uh, made strides that we had not made before where the recruitment was low, but tried to specifically go into those areas and try to look at certain high schools and other things to make sure that the recruitment efforts were higher. So I had an opportunity to travel down to the Real Time Crime Center, and it's right out of Star Wars. And I'm thankful that when we went originally to Baltimore, we came back with municipal envy, because they, but only to find out that our system is, is, is if not better uh, than theirs. I think one of the challenges might be to be able to put um, virtual patrols with live eyes on hotspots. In my district, um, I can tell you the top 10 at-risk corners, um, one of which I grew up on, 54th and Berks between uh, Berks and Montgomery, uh, is, is a killing field. Um, every now and then, and all too often, someone's going to be shot and or killed there. And we have cameras there, but what, what is our strategy to do virtual patrols in high instance time areas, and you know those better than me, when we can actually put live eyes working with boots on the ground to coordinate efforts. Is there something within our plan? Well, I mean, being candid with you, we don't have a plan to uh, cover it virtually like that because we have hopefully so many cameras that we would just never have enough police officers anyway to do that. Uh, so we do it on a modified basis where we have people who monitor those cameras down there. But uh, realistically speaking and managing expectations there, as you know, when you went down there, they don't have the capacity to, to be monitoring real time every camera. Uh, mm -hmm. And in many instances, they're watching, but they may get directed to something okay. uh, by virtue of in intel that they get. But we don't have the capacity. I don't know that any department does, but you know, I'm, I don't want to quote that, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that anyone has it to watch every camera you so, know, real time mm -hmm. and to be on top of it like so, that. So I'm aware of the security risk, but can we find auxiliary mm -hmm. retirees or uh, people that can be trained and certified to do that and find a pool of money because d particularly during the summer, we could probably cut down significantly on some of these. So, Because right now, some of these young guys, young Thundercats, they're standing, they know a camera is right there and, and, and just conduct their business as if there was none. And if we can coordinate that a little better, we might... Um, see a reduction in some of the uh, violent acts that we have. And I don't know how to do it. I'm just throwing a question out for us to put our heads together to figure it out and you know, take responsibility financially uh, to get you some more resources so that we can do that. And it's a legitimate question, and, and it's not one that I'm in disagreement with. As you know, you broached it very initially in your initial statement, mm -hmm. even about traffic, and uh, as you know, that you know, both independent or together, uh, uh, the council president and the mayor talked mm -hmm. about this traffic enforcement officer, and, and I think you have heard publicly what the FOP stance is on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's gonna be a bit of a fight. I am in support of it. It is not a novel concept. It is something that, as you know from traveling, that DC, Chicago, Everybody and many other it. cities in New York have been doing this for years, and it is absolutely a force multiplier. It's a way for you to leverage resources. In fact, I'm sure you've been multiple times. I know when you folks went. You go to New York City, you got to get right up on top of some of these traffic control officers to realize they're not police not officers. Sure. And so that means some of the guys who are, have intentions of doing things they have no business doing might not know either. And so I, I think it's a great idea, but, you know, the, the uh, messaging coming out of there is this bargaining member work. And, and finally, so the, Mr. Chairman, um, these safe havens, for lack of a better word, places that we're extending hours, uh, whether it's, uh, there was a report about a, uh, a coach in Frankfurt that opened his locker room up on Friday nights, let his young people that he coached in just so that they had a place to go play cards, 
you know, be kids and be safe. Do we have a map or grid of these opportunities, whether they're rec centers, uh, community uh, centers, that we can kind of citywide publicize so that young people know that if I can make it to this center, there's, a, there's, there's some fun and there's some safety uh, at that, that location. So we are in the process of mapping assets and resources across the city in the various neighborhoods so that we can see that. I'm gonna ask Theron Pride to come up. He's the Senior Director for Violence Prevention uh, who has been sort of leading the charge for me in terms of working with our Parks and Rec Department around some other viable opportunities that we may be able to do in terms of trying to uh, increase some of the, the coverage. Good afternoon, Theron Pride, Senior Director with Office of Violence Prevention. Appreciate the opportunity to come before the committee. And just again, uh, to reiterate what Vanessa Garrett Harley said was we are trying to do that in terms of the asset mapping, working with our partners in police. We're building out uh, a map of the city and thinking on those uh, hot spots uh, in the pinpoint areas and looking to see what rec centers, what schools, what other community institutions uh, we can turn to to make sure that they have hours and space uh, that they can create and open up for young people who might be at risk uh, if they don't have this space. And so that's uh, a process that we started when we launched the plan, and we hope to have um, some additional activity and programming at some of the rec centers that we've identified in these areas. So we uh, have to support identified that. those rec centers? So we're group? in the process right now of working with Parks and Recs, uh, looking at the pinpoint areas and seeing how we can pilot some additional programming uh, in particular, a basketball league that would have extended hours uh, during the week and on the weekend in pinpoint areas where we know uh, the rates of violence are high uh, and then really look to recruit young people that we know would be um, safer if they have this opportunity. So summer is upon us. So, you know, the clock isn't working. In Absolutely. Favor. Absolutely. And I think already with the partnerships we've had with our implementation team and, and, and uh, folks from the administration, we're moving very quickly. Uh, but we know even uh, more so to, to get this up and running. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have a brief question because um, I want to get this next panel up, but I'm going to also open it up to my colleagues to ask some questions. But I want to also get this next panel up um, just based upon um, some of our panelists' schedules. I just have one quick question for uh, Vanessa regarding you say you have bi-weekly meetings with agency leaders to coordinate an issue on gun violence. I just want to know what agencies are meeting bi-weekly, strategizing on this issue. Who's present at those meetings? So that is an executive level implementation team uh, that we built into the roadmap to make sure that it didn't just become another piece of paper and that it would actually be implemented. And that's chaired by myself and Commissioner Ross. We meet every other week. At that table is the Commissioner for License and Inspection, Commissioner for the Health Department, Commissioner for uh, the DHS as Juvenile Justice comes under DHS the uh, uh, superintendent height as well as other from his staff at the school district is at the table we have folks there uh, the head of the office of workforce development and uh, from the office of adult education uh, philadelphia works is at the table uh, others from the managing director's office my counterpart in the social services arena is there the department of behavioral health uh, commissioner david jones is at the table uh, pretty much a myriad of folks from across the various city agencies so that we can start thinking about this in a different way and a collective way as to how we put this at the, at the table. What about the district attorney? He's there, team there? They are not uh, uh, at that team, and partially that was because when we initially started, it was an effort to try and get the city folks together in the various city departments. Uh, and I think of the DA's office as being city, but more quasi-city, right, when it initially started. But we are having conversations with the district attorney's office as well about the plan uh, and how we can partner together uh, additionally. So there are conversations uh, that have been going on and are in the works. And I only mention that just simply for the fact that, um, to me, I think it's all, from a criminal justice standpoint, it's all connected um, at the end of the day. And I'm, I was reading a book called, what's this book called? You know, Oakland, it's a case study in the hope. It's Oakland, California, right? They got gangs over there. 
they reduced their uh, homicide gun violence rate by 50%, right? And when I was reading this case study, a lot of things we were already doing, right? But one key critical component was that uh, there were multi-agency weekly meetings with all the key stakeholders, um, closing what, you, what we call those gaps that you talked about in your testimony, and just making sure everybody knows who's on first, who's on second, who's on third, um, so we can address this issue um, all together as one team uh, moving forward. And so um, that's something that I, I wanted to pay um, close attention to, but I think at the end of the day, it's gonna take a coordinated effort, um, one, for us to reduce this issue of gun violence, and so I just wanna get an idea of who's meeting in those meetings. I'm gonna open this up. Um, I'm gonna start off by asking uh, Maria Keona Sanchez, then Councilwoman Sherelle Parker, Councilman Jones, uh, Thurman Pride just wanted to give you one point to sure. address that last point. Yeah, so that's a, a great example in terms of Oakland's uh, ability to reduce their homicides with, um, with by 50%. They did that over six years, starting with uh, a, an evidence-based model that they tried to implement in 2012. Uh, but prior to 2012, they were had some um, failed starts as early as 2005 with this. And so this goes back to what you're saying in terms of you need to have everyone at the table, you have to have a coordinated effort, but you have to also have the long view, you have to work urgently, you have to be committed and have everyone there. But as Oakland's story and that case study points to is that it does take time and they took six years to get to that point and really engage the faith-based community as well. And we're trying to do that in our work. We're also going to reach out not only to city partners, uh, but community members and leaders also in the faith-based community. And that's something that's also part of this work that we believe will get us to where we need to be. So I'm going to ask this for my colleagues to just bear with me just for a second, if you don't mind. Um, she's at the request of um, our district attorney, but I'm also going to ask him to, um, because it's such a critical issue, uh, Mr. Larry Krasner, and I know you have a schedule, but um, nevertheless, uh, because this is significantly um, um, crisis that we're dealing with to kind of accommodate um, our schedule as well. But I'm going to ask you to come on up to do um, your testimony. I'm going to ask for the other individuals to please stick around, but I also just want, after you give your testimony, uh, Mr. District Attorney, to still stick around as long as you can just for the simple fact that uh, we are in a crisis and um, all hands need to be on deck as we address on um, this issue of gun violence, but we will accommodate you to give you a testimony right now. Yes, Councilman, thank you very much. I know that uh, Brendan O'Malley, who is representing the Attorney General's Office as part of our gun violence task force, will be up here in a moment to speak. Um, I actually was hoping to hear what he said, but I'm sure he will, he will correctly represent the Attorney General's view of all that when he comes up. I would like to say that our head of the gun violence task force, Jude Conroy, uh, who has been in the DA's office his entire career, who I've known and been in courtrooms with for 30 years, can't be here today. But we do have JT Tartikoff, who's been with the Gun Violence Task Force a long time here and with us. There's a few points I would really like to elevate, um, but we have to put this in a proper frame before I start ticking them off, and I will tick them off to respect everyone's time. We have to put this in the frame of the reality that when New York City's bragging about its decline in homicides in Manhattan, the price of the average home in Manhattan is $1.2 million. That when Oakland is bragging about a decline in homicides, the last time I checked, the price of a home in Oakland is over $700,000. And the average price of a home in Philadelphia, last time I checked, was on the order of about $140,000. That makes a difference. And anyone who tells you it doesn't is misleading you. Because the reality is, we are in the poorest of the 10 largest cities and at certain periods of time, it has been the most violent of the 10 largest cities and that is no mistake and that goes back decades and it has everything to do with the proper way in which to view all of this, which is that these issues are structural. I'm not the only one saying that. Those are the comments of our police commissioner in the press and recently. Uh, they cannot be solved simply by arresting our way out of it. People who look at this as a cynical political moment where they can jump up and say, I'm the reincarnation of Frank Rizzo and I got the solution, we're going to crack skulls and solve it. Well, there is nothing to support that. The fact is, even if we look at the last three years of the administration of Lynn Abraham, who dubbed herself the queen of death and was all about retribution, all, was all about conviction at any cost, was all about mass incarceration, you'll find that even today, the average 
at this time of year for homicides in the last three years of her administration was a little bit higher than where we are now. So that is the framing where we have to see this. Yes, as one of you so eloquently articulated, get jobs, economic opportunity, jobs, education, people coming out of high school, people coming out with hope. When you're a 16-year-old who has hope, who sees a future, who wants to finish school, who sees a job, who thinks you're going to live past the age of 30, you are not so drawn to a gun in your right hand. When you grew up in a neighborhood where the men weren't all missing because they were all locked up, you are more likely to see hope. So if we are to talk about real solutions here as opposed to being back sitting here in 10 years when there's another spike of violent crime, if we are to do that, and I, sh I should actually correct that, when there's another spike of shootings and homicides, because we actually have seen a reduction in violent crime uh, over the last year and a half, we'll just be back here doing this again. This is not the first anti-violence plan that has existed. There's another one. It's about 15, 18 years ago. And I don't say that in any way to denigrate it, because I think this is incredibly important. And I would be delighted to be included at every step with this anti-violence plan. But that's the reality. These issues are structural, they are huge. They are the result of decades of the city not solving issues of poverty. None of that takes away from the reality that every single one of us has personal responsibility, that every single one of us, as I even know that you have privately or maybe even publicly talked about, every single one of us has made bad decisions and has been personally responsible for it, had the chance to go forward and go a different direction, and you know, have been able to do so. So I don't minimize that. Now let's talk about what we can do right now, because politicians, and I guess to some extent we're all politicians, we have to answer to voters right now, we have to answer to constituents right now. The big picture is what I said, that we need to change that structure. We need to change all of that. But the small picture is how can we make it better right now? And I will tick these things off. There was a question earlier about whether having 72 officers who uh, posted outrageously discriminatory and brutal um, postings being off the street has an impact. Yeah, it's a good impact. It's a good impact. <laughs> It's a good impact because those officers who do not represent the average police officer in this city, let's not forget, we have 6,500 active officers. We only have 330 engaging this kind of conduct. Uh, they, those statements represent a range of bad speech, right? But that is the number out of 6,500. But those 72 people number one, will not be missed because they increase distrust. And when you have distrust between the community and the police, it is harder to solve homicides. It is harder to solve shootings. It is harder to have a good clearance rate because if the community does not trust the police, and this is just as true of the DA's office, then the community will not engage. So that, I suggest respectfully, is the right thing to do. I suggest that the commissioner is doing the right thing in once again trying to bring integrity to his department and restore the public's faith in the incredibly important uh, and laudable job of being law enforcement. These are the issues where we can work together, and I hope we will, will work together. I need seizure analyses. I've been a lawyer in this city for over 30 years. I was in criminal court four to five days a week and during my entire administration and for a few months before, we have had to deal with the reality that we do not have seizure analyses to prove possession of drug cases. And when we get seizure analyses to prove possession with the intent to deliver or delivery controlled substance, we get them months later than we should. This is an issue that the city has been aware of since the beginning of this administration. I'm not going to tell you that it's somehow all the city's fault. I know that the police commissioner has said publicly that he does not have the money to fix this. I know there are issues that arose in the beginning because fentanyl presents testing issues. There are some issues around danger, although a bit exaggerated. There are other issues around the quality of the test. Most of the field tests for fentanyl will come back inconclusive. But what I'm telling you is that in 30 years as a lawyer, there was never a problem in Philadelphia getting a seizure analysis so a prosecutor could proceed with a case or prove with a case. We do not have them. It is absurd to ask us to be in a position to hold people accountable and have to wait months and months and months unnecessarily for seizure analyses for cases involving possession with the intent to deliver and delivery. I've been clear on this point with Mr. Abernathy. 
I've been clear on this point for a very long time, and I have once again had the chance to remind the mayor that this is crucial. There's no reason for this. The excuses I have gotten have ranged from, well, I'll look for a vendor, and then nobody got back to me. And the next excuse I got is, well, maybe it's got to be done by city workers when we all know the truth, because we have met with the Chem Lab. The truth is the Chem Lab can't immediately expand. So I need seizure analyses. We have a connection between killings and the drug trade in the middle of an opioid crisis, the idea that we're supposed to be asked to make these bricks without straw is absurd. That's point one. Point two, we, are, we, are, we actually think it is very exciting to hear from the department that they want to increase police presence. Makes perfect sense by every criminological standard. And I, you know, fortunately I can tell you good news, which is I was approached by both the commissioner and the mayor last year asking us to have more police on the street by taking them out of court. There was a whole lot of wholly unnecessary subpoenaing being done in the prior administration of police. Things as ridiculous as subpoenaing, you know, all 19 officers involved in a homicide case for the entire week of the case when they were only needed for a day or two each. Right? So we corrected a lot of that. But there's one serious area that we're trying to correct now. And I will tell you that the commissioner and I have already spoken about this. He's looking into it. People in our, you know, in our offices have been working on it. So I hope we'll have a good resolution. But what happens right now is we still have one serious problem, which is that there is a process of self-subpoena in which the officers at the very first listing of a preliminary hearing are self-subpoenaed usually, I believe, by their detectives. We took a look at one of our courtrooms. There were 78 officers subpoenaed into that courtroom one morning. 46 of those subpoenas were unnecessary. That is one courtroom. We're talking about 72 people around the city. Well, we got about eight, 10, depends on the day, courtrooms where we're subpoenaing officers. Let's take 46 unnecessary officers and let's put them back where they can be on the street, where that overtime money can go to those additional parole, uh, patrols. You know, I would not presume to get into the lane of the police department, but I think it is every bit of criminology says it's a wonderful idea to have more police presence out there. And this is a way to do it without even spending any more money. So I'm looking forward to cooperation in that regard. The public is not aware of this, uh, but I should tell you that the court system, the public defender and I have been in discussions and they've been very positive about taking our shooting cases and putting them into the same courtroom where the homicide preliminary hearings are hurt, are hurt. So in other words, do all of these preliminary hearings in which someone is injured in a shooting and some people are killed in a shooting, put them into the same courtrooms where both sides can have the capable attorneys they need, where we're not running from room to room, where we have a more systematic way of treating victims and witnesses and protecting them, where both sides can have things move along quickly there's a great importance when you have a shooting case and being able to resolve it in nine months instead of 18. Because anyone else who is out there and who knows what happens when you shoot people, they're a lot more concerned about the certainty of being caught and punished than they are about the amount of time in jail. So if we can expedite that, to a shorter period of time, which is what this would do, then we'll be in a position for the lesson to be learned among the friends of whoever it was that fired that shot and injured somebody else. I can tell you that the public-private partnership is something that we're extremely interested in for over a year. We have been uh, trying to provide assistance as we could with Chris Woods, who is president of 1199C. He has been working with other union officials on possibilities for reentry, but also job programs for at-risk youth, things of that sort. I would encourage anyone in the city, in government or not, who is interested in being a part of that, um, please be in contact with Mr. Woods and understand that, that, we have the f that he has the full support of the DA's office in efforts to try to, to utilize all of that. Uh, polymer guns. This is a huge issue. I don't, there's no immediate fix on this, but a polymer gun is a plastic gun. It is what they call an 80% gun. Basically, if you go to the Oaks Gun Show, what you can do is at one table you can buy a plastic gun and you can go to the next table and you can buy the, the metal barrel, the metal trigger mechanism, a few other pieces, and you can go home and you can fix it up. There's no serial number on that plastic gun. Background checks are not required, so guess who's buying these things? Who needs a plastic gun? And they're not buying them one at a time. I have specific information that there are instances of people buying dozens or scores of these plastic guns, putting them in a duffel bag, pulling out a wad of cash, putting the cash down, and walking out. These are guns that are intended for crime. 
Nobody needs a plastic gun, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem in Philadelphia. My information is that the Philadelphia Police Department collected 12 of them in 2018. They collected 43 in 2019 so far. And these guns are plentiful. They are an end run around the already insufficient federal and state laws we have to protect us from this kind of gun violence. We need a solution for that. Our probation and parole departments are woefully overburdened. And that has an impact because when your caseload is twice as big as it should be, it is very hard to focus on the most dangerous offenders. We've been trying to work with probation and parole since August. We've been trying to reduce their roles. We've been trying to put those probation and parole officers in a position where they can do their best work, and this is no bad reflection on them, but we have been hampered every step of the way. Probation and parole has refused to identify to us categories of individuals who've been successful on probation and parole who could be removed from those roles. Let us understand that Philadelphia has on the order of slightly under 40,000 people on supervision. About one of every 22 adults in the city of Philadelphia, when you walk on, down the street, is currently under probation or parole supervision. New York City, the whole thing, 12,000 people, the whole thing, all of those boroughs. Our rate of supervision is somewhere around 20 or 25 higher, 25 times higher than New York. That is an unacceptable situation, and it is no wonder then that we have recidivism rates for mid-level and high-level offenders that, according to the most recent study I saw, are close to 50% within two years. We need to break the logjam, the roadblock, with probation and parole not, willing be, not being willing to give up the info, to get the unnecessary people off the rolls so we can focus on the people whose, uh, whose attention is required. Focus deterrence, yes, we are in. We are in so long as the carrot is as good or better than the stick. And that's because that's the only way it works. That's not my opinion. That is the opinion of every person in the Philadelphia Police Department I dealt with who examined the use of folks' deterrence previously. And no, it can't also become some kind of extremist, heavy-handed thing where we're going to punish grandma just because the grandkid did something. It's got to be fair or we're going to drive this wedge once again between law enforcement and the community. We're not going to be able to solve crimes. I have only two more things to say in my list here. I promise to rip through it. And I will. We are doing something in the DA's office that was done very poorly in the DA's office previously. It's called cooperation. It means when you have someone who's been involved in a serious incident, you call them in and you offer them incentives to get them to give you information. We have solved homicides strictly on the strength of the fact that there is some trust that if people come in and they talk about other people killing people or they come in and talk about other people dealing guns, serious crimes of that sort, that there will, be some kind of, uh, there will be some kind of reward, some kind of reduction for their accepting responsibility and giving up the information. Well, that kind of situation only exists when you have the criminal defense bar that trusts you enough and the community, the mothers of these individuals that trust the DA's office enough that they say, all right, do it. Go in there, tell them what you did, tell them what other people did, know that there'll be some reward for that just the same way the feds have done it so successfully for so long. If you substantially cooperate, that we will be able to do something and we intend to continue doing that, but it has already borne fruit and been successful. Finally, I just want to say this. We requested more money in our budget and we requested it for a lot of things. One of the things we requested was we wanted to double our drug prosecution unit which had done wiretaps to dismantle a 20-year drug organization at Kip and Cambria. 67 arrests of mid- and high-level drug dealers, father and son drug organization that was passed down. We're not talking about picking on you know, the 18-year-old kid who will be selling in the morning, and if you arrest him, there'll be another kid selling in the afternoon, which does nothing. We took the whole organization down. The only thing we didn't take down was the international source at that time, okay? All we need all we needed was some more Spanish-speaking detectives, a little bit more money, but when we came to council and we asked for an increase of about $3 million in our budget, instead what we walked away with was a $3 million reduction in our budget, a reduction. 
When we came to council, we said we need money for DNA because every time we have a guilty person, in, we have an innocent person in jail, we have a guilty person who went free and feels emboldened. We need to increase the role of DNA in, in order to make sure we have the right people. We didn't get that either. In fact, what we got was a reduction of $3 million. Now, I have spoken to many of you, and, and there are several other plans and programs that we would really like to push that we think could have a tremendous impact on crime generally. Um, and I've spoken to many of you about it. I think that we are all on the same page, that that needs to be rectified in September, and I will be back. But I do want you all to understand that if we're going to ask the district attorney's office to do its best work, and we are doing the best work we possibly can, we're going to need resources. We're going to need seizure analyses. We're going to need funding for the kinds of units that when we have this intertwined opioid crisis with this crisis of violence can work together effectively to do this. It is not enough that during this administration, violent crime is down 3%, and it is. That is not enough because we cannot tolerate this level of homicide. We cannot tolerate this level of shooting. It is not enough that during this administration, crime overall is down 1%. That's not enough because it is not an answer for the people who live in the neighborhoods, who are being victimized, whose kids are being traumatized, who are suffering through this. It is not enough. This DA's office is going to work with not only those at this table, but everyone in this room who is willing to work with us, the reality is that while we have to correct these structural issues, if we're to have long-term solutions, there are things that we can do right now, but we all need to do that working together, as the two of you have mentioned. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to, we're going to defer our comments as co-chairs and allow our um, colleagues to begin the line of questioning. I'm going to start with Council Maria Keona Sanchez. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I won't ask the DA um, any questions this morning because he will be participating this evening at 5.30 as we have another public hearing around the opioids and the relationship between opioid and some of the uptick in violence. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all of the folks who are here. I think everyone here um, sincerely cares and we've been working hard at this problem. For the police commissioner in particular, for district council people, you know, we develop these relationships with our ca captains and our commanding officers. And unfortunately, we learn over time that captains do the best they can with what they have. In light of the fact that we're doing this emergency declaration and the mayor has made a commitment to, to really make investments, and this is investments in public safety, not talking about restorative investments in neighborhoods, which is a whole separate conversation. Um, we all know that the, the police contract allows for police to take vacation during this time. And, and it's very, very frustrating for me to, to complain to a captain or a commanding officer about things that happen in the neighborhood when I know his census is down. Um, I know we've removed 73 people from the street. How do I and you and all of us assure people that the combination of vacation time, the benching of people on the, on the street, that we are going to have a full cadre of police officers in these neighborhoods and in these hot spots, particularly because we know that it's going to take massive overtime if we're gonna do it correctly. Well, uh, thank you for acknowledging it's contractual for the summertime. That's since I've been on this job. That is not a new concept. Uh, you know, my friend and predecessor fought hard uh, to change the contract, and the best that we could do was start it a little earlier in May for brand new police officers. That's it. I mean, when I came on and all these folks over here, it was even a more condensed period than that. Um, that is uh, a troubling issue that is, I have learned from traveling and being in uh, the company of my colleagues that you're right. In many instances, the summer vacations are spread out over the 12 months. That is something, quite frankly, I would love to have uh, some impact on, but many police commissioners have tried uh, to include this one. As I said before about the 72, um, that is an action that was taken. Um, I didn't want those posts to happen, but they did. I got to do something, mm -hmm. right? And in the meantime, until we finish our investigation, which won't be protracted, 
Um, we will be, as I said, that investigation will be conducted in stages. Those officers who are capable and able will go back in stages. So it's not like all 72 will be out on the street or off the street forever. There are some who will never return to the street, mm -hmm. but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know that we've added officers to your division in particular, mm -hmm. and it's not just yours, but yours in particular, since you raised the question, you know you just got a significant number of officers to the 25th district. Um, the largest compliment actually in the last from the last class as well as uh, people you've gotten in the 24th and so one of the benefits of not having a struggle like some departments are having in hiring people is we are able to staff our department you even heard me say that one of the things that i'm really not asking the mayor for beyond where we are now is more manpower we are asking for additional resources but that's from the business community right because you, you reach a finite amount of resources where the city just doesn't have it. And so because there are more departments than just the police department, and there are, I would argue, even some who need the, the money just as much. So uh, we have your uh, division staff, but you know, of course, too, that it's not just staff with officers from East Division. The staff with people, narcotics officers are staples there. They're there all the time, you know, as well as other officers. You're going to start seeing even more on foot beats as these officers from the 25th transition out of their officer training um, uh, schooling, if you will. Uh, so it, I would argue that no chief will ever say that they have enough, you know. I mean, but you do reach a point where you have to be reasonable about it. You know, I can't come to you and say that now we have 65, 25, you know, plus was actually 75 is what we're budgeted for, 65, 75 now. Uh, but I can't just keep coming and say, give me the same amount of cops that we had in the 70s, 8,000. Quite frankly, we don't have the same population that we had. And I uh, hope to get back to 2 million maybe for the city, but that's also what the population was when we had 8,000 police officers. So those days are over. But we, we have the, the, we think we have the, enough officers under the circumstances. We always have people who are off the street for any number of reasons, injured on no, duty I I and any, wanna, anything else. I just want to get to a place that this summer there is a recognition that because of the uptick, and obviously we're in the epicenter, that, that we are not, to use, to use the term, we're not gun shy about putting the resources necessary in neighborhoods, right? I don't want to find myself in a situation where in the 24th, in the 25th, or anywhere in the city for that matter, that we have one car in a quadrant, right? And so what I'm saying to you is I need this council, I know all of my colleagues, we want to know what overtime is it going to take to make sure that our district commanders have the resources that they need, right? Because for folks in the neighborhood, when they come downtown and they see 40 police officers around Dilworth Plaza, but there's not one in the neighborhood, that's a problem. We can't explain that, right? So tell us what you need. And let us be sure that in this summer, we do a recognition of the limitations with the contract so that we have better coverage. And look, can you, can you remember that overtime conversation next budget here? That, you know, <laughs> as long as you remember that part, because that we don't have any, so I, I got to take a little issue with you thinking I'm gun shy about putting people on the street. No, no, no. Uh, we, no. We, we not. I, I'm saying is, I, what I'm saying is, first of all, we always have the overtime. I never okay. complain about overtime because I'm the one that needs it in the neighborhood. So I'm not the one. That's not okay. me. Okay. But what I want to ensure folks this summer in particular, as summer ticks up, and the beauty about having parks renovated, there are more and more people out in the street, and that is a good thing. I just wanna make sure that in our neighborhoods, that if you say to us, cause you know you break down your overtime by unit, service, transportation, all, that you say to us in the neighborhoods for us to get this right, this is what we're gonna need, and that you do that in a way that you don't blink about it because it's gonna be hugely important in us winning public trust and us demonstrating to pe people that we really have a commitment about quality of life in the neighborhoods. I don't so I'm lending you my support and I appreciate appropriations, that. but I want to make sure that happens. I don't want to talk to a commanding officer and have him tell me he don't got a car out in a, in a quadrant. Well, I think uh, the deputies and the chiefs uh, 
behind me will tell you that that, that edict is already out there. And that, okay. that's what we did relative to extending tours. And, and it's something we've had to do for a long time on certain days of the week, which I won't say publicly because other people watch TV and I don't want them to, to know what our right. manpower is. But um, we, we are not at all apprehensive about doing that. And where we need to spend money, we, we will. We will also mandate that it's done responsibly, though. You know, I can't have people thinking it's a black hole and that they could spend money just because. So we, we, we believe in both in that delicate balance, and we will always do that. But rest assured, we're not afraid of stuff like that. Okay. You know? I, I appreciate that. And then lastly, because I know everybody wants around, and I, I want to be respectful to my colleagues. For, for Vanessa, um, could you provide to the chair the listing of the organizations you funded in the neighborhood, you know, we keep having this conversation. We've spent the last 10, 11 years um, figuring out how we restore some very pivotal grassroots, very neighborhood-based initiatives that we used to fund, whether it was the 300 parent truancy officers to the curfew centers. I mean, I can give you a laundry list of community investments we had that after 2008 and 2009, we dismantled and we've not restored. And 700,000 is a drop in the bucket. But to the extent, to, to the extent that the organizations you funded help us cover some gaps, I know Councilwoman Bass has really been harping on, on us extending our hours at our rec centers. Um, to the extent that, that there are additional gaps because we didn't find partners, because remember, we put them out of business. To the extent that we didn't find some of those partners in the area, if you could share that with all of us, we want to make sure that whether through our rec centers, our libraries, and some of our community stakeholders, that we try to provide as many activities as possible, engagement activities, you know, I give kudos to all my colleagues. I know all of us do park events and evenings and movie nights out, but we, we have to put all of those initiatives on steroids this summer to keep people engaged. And so if you see gaps that we need to fill, please tell us. I will do that, and we will definitely supply the list of the 47 that we awarded. It was also attached, I believe, to the press release uh, that went out uh, probably a week or so ago. Um, but we will get that for you. I want the gaps. I know who, who, some, some folks just didn't have capacity, as you know. 5,000 to 25,000 is not a whole lot. And you and I have talked about how, what are we asking folks to give us in, in return. I want to know where the gaps are that we need to fill. Thank you. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to do this in terms of this round of questioning, and I want to go by based upon people who showed up first. But do key individuals, in terms of my colleagues, have specific questions for District Attorney Larry Krasner because he's on a tight schedule? So if you have a specific line of questioning for him, um, I just want to um, defer to you at this particular time so we can, okay. No one? Yes. Councilman Allen Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the District Attorney Krasner. What is the cost of the seizure analysis? Um, I don't know. I can have my staff figure that out. I it may depend on which substance it is and how much is being tested, but I cannot tell you exactly offhand. Okay, and you feel that's important for us to uh, provide to you? It is absolutely essential in the, in the possession with intent to deliver cases and in the delivery cases, in other words, in the drug dealing cases, that we get it and that we get it as early as possible. We are wasting all kinds of other costs on okay. keeping people in jail forever while it shows up. It is also important that we get it, on the, get it on the possession cases, not merely because we must have it in order to prove the case if we are prosecuting, but also it becomes our leverage that we can use to try to assist people into some form of treatment. If we have no leverage, then we can't do anything with that. And then the other point is this, and it's really a very important point. There's a lot of knowledge that can be taken from a seizure analysis that tells you things like purity as to whether or not you are close to the source. It's pertinent. And we're dealing with, obviously, a terrible crisis of three and four people dying every day, from, uh, primarily from fentanyl, really. Sometimes analyses can be done for things like purity that can actually save lives, or that a particular colored bag is killing people. And that's, that's a whole more complex discussion. But some of these things can have tremendous impact even on aspects like that. Okay, well, if you could provide the cost to the chair, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Sherelle Parker. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to each of you. While not just specifically for District Attorney Krasner, I would like him, Mr. Chairman, to respond to the question um, on the record. Um, let me just start by uh, thanking each of you um, for not coming here today uh, proclaiming that there would be a single silver bullet you know, sort of strategy to um, rid, rid our city um, of these challenges, but noting for the record that they are complex and it's going to uh, take us working together in order to solve them. Um, they were not a room expert um, AOPs today, articulators of the pop problem presenting those solutions. But District Attorney uh, Krasner, you struck a chord with me because you mentioned a constituency that we don't hear about often when you said grandmoms. Um, having been raised by my, uh, my grandparents, there is nothing more painful than watching a young man, and Commissioner Ross, you'll remember this case. He was a student at one of our local uh, charter schools in our area. He was a star athlete. He was on his way to a college um, and was shot and, and murdered. And the two gentlemen who were responsible um, were eventually caught. The call that no one saw was the call from the grandmother of one of the young men who actually was involved in the shooting saying, Sherelle, I did the best I could in trying to raise him, but I didn't know what else I could do. I know that may sound like a very simple line that we don't hear about that makes it on the news because a lot of our young people are being raised by someone other than their biological parents. We refer to it in social and human services as kinship care. My question to you is that when you talked about earlier reaching that demographic between the ages of 16 and 34, We've heard from law enforcement, our commanding officers, that many of those who get engaged later in violent crime started District Attorney Krasner and Commissioner at a very young age um, with nonviolent crimes. My question is this, has there ever been any, any intersection, intersectionality between the DA's office the police department, social and human services for young people who get engaged in the system and being able to communicate to, if not their parents, their caretakers. They've entered into the system. We want to let you know that these opportunities are available. If they're the employment opportunities that Councilman Jones talked about, the SAT prep program, all of the, 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 the organizations that received the $700,000 in funding, um, those that are currently operating, do we, from a preventive uh, standpoint, find a way to get that information into the hands of the people who are not doing Google searches to read the press release to find out what organizations were funded. So I thank you so much for asking that question. It gives me a perfect opportunity to talk about some things that we do and, how, and explain how much we would like to do more. Uh, present with me here today is Tariq Glasgow. Tariq, can you raise a hand? Tariq um, it works very steadily. Uh, in, in the, out of the DA's office, but in connection with our gun violence task force on various different programs, uh, some to reach 16-year-olds and some to reach 5-year-olds who will become 16-year-olds soon enough, and we better deal with issues before they get there. Uh, he is, for example, involved with our RESET program, which is uh, resources, employment, skills, educational training program. He works with Biddy Ball. This is little kids running around with basketballs between two and 10 years of age, mentors who are mentoring them between 16 and 28 years of age in connection with uh, Dixon High School. And he also is working with the citywide junior mentors with Ebony Wortham from my office, with the Police Department Advisory Council. An attorney in my office by the name of Kwambina Coker is work, working with the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership on a project where the probation department, the police, and the DA's office try to identify young people who are most at risk of being killed. Sorry, say the partners, probation, police. Probation, police, and the DA's office mm -hmm. all work together uh, to identify young people most at risk of being killed or of killing or injuring others. We also work with George Mosey and, and the Office of Violence Protection on this 
problem because it is that kind of a holistic solution that is actually going to accomplish something that I could go on and on about various other programs that we have. But is obviously, there, is, is there, D.A. Krasner, is there a, a, a tangible, and, and I know I heard that we're working on mapping out the new organizations that were funded near the hot spots, and, and I think that's great because that, that's new, that's additional funding. But for all of the existing programs that are offered in the city, when grandmama, grandpa, or auntie, or uncles, uh, the child that they are caring for, you know, uh, enters the system, do we have something very tangible that we can say, hey, th take this home, take a look at this, so they can sit down with a counselor to, to figure out whether or not there is a way. Because I do think we have multiple programs in the city of Philadelphia that are great programs, but most times the people who could benefit from them, they're not the people who are accessing them. So I, I guess my, my advocacy and my ask today is, although you have that program that you're working on and trying to work in a collaborative manner, if there is something we should be doing to assist you in developing something tangible, I don't know, Councilman Johnson, if that's something that the business community could be acting to help us fund because, you know, the well does run dry, right? So, so maybe if there was a very tangible directory that was in barber shops, that were in hair salons, that were at senior centers, you know, the senior could pick them up and put them in yes. their bag. So I, I just wanted to note yeah. that for the record. And the, and the last and final thing I want to say, Commish, thank you on the record for talking about the analytics. You know, data-driven and research-based. And I don't know whether or not this exists. If it does, please help me so that I can begin to communicate it to my constituency. Um, the use of texting now is obviously a powerful tool. I know the hotline number, um, the tips number, because we see that often in public service announcements on television. Um, is there anywhere in the nation, and or are we piloting here in the city of Philadelphia, a vehicle that would allow people to text in real time a tip. I may not want to call the tip line. I may not want to dial a number. Or, or is this, or the, is the technology that I'm referencing like not in existence anywhere? There, there are other departments. I don't know if this is on. There are other departments that are using, you know, text to tip, and 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 you can text in the 686 tips. So I'm told, and so, but we we need to build out on that. That's actually a good point to make sure that. Uh, you know, there are more avenues. The technology, this is how people use it. We've got to afford people the way to get us more information. It is about intel, as you're kind of suggesting. Uh, the ability to leverage that to get information, because we talk about it all the time, after un uh, sadly, after, usually after incidents, that you know, all we need sometimes is for someone to say, this is about to kick off, you know? Mm -hmm. um, sadly, though, there are some instances when people don't know it, and uh, I don't know that in that graduation party in that quiet area of the 12th district that anyone knew that that was going to happen before but, it happened. Otherwise, well, he probably me, would have got out of Dodge, you know, at least you would like to think. So some of it unfolds very quickly, but some of it doesn't, to your point. And so we, we have to stay abreast of all this technology, and that's what we're asking for. That's what we want to get in the way of additional resources. If we can build that out, Commission, in real time, and if additional resources are required from that, that could we could have sort of a universal number that people knew that they could just directly text in real time information to and someone was monitoring it, I think that could be uh, really helpful and I think residents of the city of Philadelphia um, would text information uh, uh, more readily. And I agree and, and, and I think they actually I know from going to these uh, major city conferences, they, there are vendors out there that have uh, that. stuff like that and so we, we need to just explore that some more. Thank and, and you. Thank to, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Just as a matter of personal privilege, I just wanted to add, um, maybe perhaps partnering with the faith-based community. I remember when I was an intern with um, former state rep Harold James, um, and the pastors in South Philadelphia would allow for individuals to come and just put the information inside a box in the church and go about their business. And Harold James, who's also a former police officer, we use that information as a matter of intel, but also probably was being was not being said. Also in this room is um, sometimes we know what's going on before it actually kicks off, and I know that because I still live in the neighborhood. I'm still on the ground. I still get what's going on inside the neighborhood, and it's a lot of times trying to prevent. This is what the police really can't. 
I don't get involved and in, in pursue much. Sometimes the people in the community have to step up, right? From a parenting standpoint and say, and say, listen, I know this is going down inside the neighborhood. How do we figure out how to intervene before this thing kicks off as a powder keg? Because I see that very rare on a regular basis. And then when we get to the funeral, sometimes as family members by seven degrees of separation, the parents know each other, right? But if you know, you know somebody was doing gang signs on social media, right? And you know there's a back and forth. At some point in time, we have to step up and say, wait a minute, how do we intervene and stop this um, before it kicks off to a whole different level? And I think there's another panel that's gonna talk about the work that they're doing from a crisis intervention standpoint to be proactive as opposed to reactive before these things and, and councilman thank you because that that's what you just said is is going to be far more effective and impactful than anything we can ever do with regard to being in front of stuff i mean because people will know and their voices will resonate in a way where you know many times we won't even know but you'll know folks and there are folks behind me who i know are already doing this on their own level who are they many of them go uncelebrated but they you it's hard to measure what they stopped, right? And so if they know Rich Ross was, was gonna get into it with Myron Patterson, somebody was gonna pull out a gun, but they were able to intervene, that, that doesn't get celebrated necessarily, and it should be, right? Because I know it's people back there doing it. I know them, you know, so I know they're getting that in, and, and so I thank them for that. You know, this is why I'm all for the intervener interrupter concept, because I believe it does work. I believe it, it is a tool that assists us and it's a force multiplier for us, no question. Thank you. Councilman Derek Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Harley and DA Krasner, both in Ms. Harley on page three of your written testimony and Mr. Krasner in your verbal testimony, both made reference to um, focused deterrence. And one, and it's, from what I gather, there seems to be a, a difference of perspective in reference to how people are brought into the, the program of focus deterrence. But I want to get a, a perspective from um, both of you and, and Commissioner Ross, you can feel free to jump in as well, get a perspective on how we can get beyond some of the differences in how people get into the focus deterrence um, program but focus more on how do we use it as an effective tool to help those that are on the block who are doing things that they may not want to do, but because of poverty and because they have not had an opportunity to see other um, availabilities for them to bring in resources for their home, for their children, don't see another pathway. And there are those who have gone or have been in that path and made a change that can be helpful to help some of these young people, especially young men, get out of that path. And I guess my concern, because I've been following Focus Deterrence for a number of years, um, and I think it's an effective strategy. I think it's also an employment opportunity where we can employ people who've had a different path to help those who are trying to do what they are now doing. So I want to get your perspective on that so we can use this as a tool going forward. So we have been talking about focus deterrence for a period of time, at least uh, in the short time that I've been in this position, and I've both talked to D.A. Krasner as well as Commissioner Ross. I think we are turning the corner on that um, with some additional work uh, that we've all been doing, as well as State Representative uh, Movita uh, johnson Harrell. We actually have a meeting scheduled in about two weeks with the rate of the folks at the table that we just talked about, as well as bringing in sort of the uh, Arthur or the founder of Focus Deterrence, David Kennedy, will be coming into the city to work with us again. We believe that we can, working together, craft a model that will work in Philadelphia. I, I was not around uh, when the model was in place before, but I do understand that there were some issues with it, and so we, we are willing to take those lessons learned uh, from the experts who were at the table, both from DA's office as well as the police department, and, and craft that. I know one of the issues was many thought it was more stick than carrot. It's a stick and carrot mm -hmm. model, and certainly we are committed to trying to ensure that the carrot part does not get lost and that we work with the various agencies to prioritize what's going to be needed to make the model build out exactly as you said, both with workforces and other services. Well, they, 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 well, to just to jump in, I think part of the reason why there was not enough carrot because there was not enough resources to hire more people to do what was needed and make those connections with 
the Chamber of Commerce and other entities to provide more resources and job opportunities. Uh, and so I always thought focus deterrence was underfunded. We did not employ enough people that could be out in the community and give them the resources to help those who are trying to make a change in that regard. Mayor, let me just say briefly, point. there's nothing brand new about our interest in some form of focus deterrence. Actually, the city and the DA's office were working on a grant almost a year ago uh, that for reasons beyond, you know, the DA's office's control was canceled. But it, it was always the understanding that we're looking for something that's fair and effective. Effective is going to mean that there's a carrot. Fair is going to mean that there's a carrot. A lot of the other stuff's really just details. And the words focused in deterrence, they don't necessarily stand for only one way of doing things, but we are committed to trying to work together on effective ways of getting control of that population that are most at risk of either killing people or being killed. So, I mean, I, one thing, and real quick, I, I think would be effective if there's some, um, and I know uh, this term you put in um, additional dollars for your budget as well as others, but as we go through this unfortunate situation we currently have and for the summer, but as we go forward into next year's budget, Having those resources together in a, in a not a siloed approach, but a collective approach of how we can get those resources, I think will be effective. To, to that point, uh, Ms. Mr. Councilperson, the one thing I'm taking from all of this is that individually, each of you are doing great things. And I'm, you know, I know because as chair of public safety, I get to see slices of it, just like fingers of. If they go like this, you can barely do anything with it. If they come together and start working together, like in, and I'm not saying that you're not, but in a regimented way that breaks down some of those silos, that I, I, I see the solutions to a lot of the things systematically that we can get done. Now, I say this, it doesn't absolve us from our responsibility of putting some money to those solutions. And I'm willing to, uh, take that on and with my colleagues help, we can assure that. But imagine you guys coming here collectively on one page, saying he needs this, she needs that, he needs the other and that's it. And that's how we saw this problem. I, I think, and I, I, no, I actually believe with conviction, we can, we can make a dent in what's going on in our city. And I'm not saying that you're not, I'm, I'm saying that we need more of it. Uh, you said, somebody said 2.0 added to it. If you guys, similar to what the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee did some years ago, different interests, not always on the same page, you, you and your offices were a part of it. Eventually, a memo went around the table and we closed the prison. We reduced the population on State Road by 45%. We, and, and, and guess what? Crime didn't automatically go up. So I'm saying on this specific topic of gun violence, if we kind of regularly kind of close doors, no, no media, and really put things on the table of what we need to make a difference, we will make a difference. And I just believe it. Right. Okay. Thank um, you, Mr. Chairman. One other follow-up question. Um, it's in reference to, I think, the elephant in the room that we haven't discussed is that we, unfortunately, city of Philadelphia is a city of first class in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, but we have um, laws in the Commonwealth that impact our ability to do what we need to do in reference to guns. Um, in April of this year, um, city council in Pittsburgh, along with Mayor Bill Peduto, passed legislation regarding assault style weapons in Pittsburgh. Um, now, I know there was an uh, immediate response by those, those who were in the gun rights community in reference to the legislation and in reference to preemption, but I'm curious from the perspective of uh, Commissioner Ross, District Attorney Krasner, and Ms. Harley, I know the latter two are both attorneys, your thoughts on that litigation um, and um, if those are steps that we should take in this body. Well, I me mean, personally, I, I, I think you should, uh, because we've got to get everything in place that we can to uh, stop the scourge of violence. The, the problem, being somewhat pragmatic, I, I, and the DA is better adept in, in the legal mind as you are than I am, I don't know about the teeth that it has. And so when you talk about preemption, right, and, and the fight that comes with it, I would just want to make sure that if we're going to enter that arena, that we're doing so with some degree of managing expectations about what can really be done. Obviously, 
the optimal of this is done on the Commonwealth level, right? Which doesn't seem like we're getting any movement or will ever. But I'm in support of anything that's going to help. I just, I just caution us about doing things where we might be spinning our wheels to say that we're doing something that doesn't really have that much of an impact. But I'm certainly not against it. Well, let me just say this. I, you know, I think that this body has been pretty courageous in the past about trying to come up with solutions and trying to avoid the trap of the NRA wasting everybody's time and money. And I think the lost and stolen um, ordinance is an example of that. that. That will be attacked, we know. The NRA's coming. They always do. But there it turned out that there was an answer. And I think it's a pretty good answer, which is you're not preempted because it's not regulating guns. It's regulating people who say they used to have guns. And we do, in fact, regulate people, right? So it may be that there are some of these that can be done carefully and creatively. And my office is certainly willing to sit down and have that discussion that can come out of city council. I think the, the commissioner's comments are appropriate, though. We are in a country that is insanely drowning in guns. You go to Germany, you go to Portugal, you're looking at a rate of homicide that is 9% or 10% of the U.S., their level of incarceration is also 9 or 10% of the U.S. Guess why? They don't have more guns than people. We have a legislature that won't do anything about it. We have a federal government that won't do anything about it. I mean, the good news today is the head of the NRI just resigned. I hope the next one resigns too, you know? I mean, what a bunch of bums. And frankly, where are our elected officials calling them out? And where are our voters to vote out elected officials who put up with them? So the real solutions here ultimately probably are federal, and they probably are state. And we are in we are in a tough spot. But my office is more than willing to sit down and see if we can work together on any proposed ordinance that might pass muster. Thank you very much. Um, next, um, Councilman Helen Gilman. I also just want to reiterate, just briefly, right? Because I know we have the preemption law, and we know in the state of Pennsylvania, um, unless you overturn, and I, even if you overturn the party to Democrat, and I'm a former state representative, you're probably still not going to pass a bill in the state of Pennsylvania because half the Democrats are gun owners, they're <coughs> very heavily supported by the NRA. But, and the next panel can get to this issue, but that still doesn't release of, of, of our responsibility of tracking on where these guns are coming from. Um, I'm born and raised in the South Philly all my life. I'm proud of me becoming an elected official through the grace that God had a chance to change my life around. And the artillery that I see on the streets today is not the artillery that I saw on the streets in the early 80s and 90s. And there are much more guns on the streets in the city of Philadelphia now than there were when I was a kid growing up. Where they're coming from, I talked to the commissioner, a lot of guns are being stolen out of individual homes. But I also believe and tracking and finding and those who sell these guns have to also be a greater priority as well. Because at the end of the day, they are coming from somewhere. And at the end of the day, we don't want young people to pick them up, but at the end of the day, still put emphasis on um, tracking where they're coming from. And I think our next panel uh, will talk more about uh, the Gun Violence Task Force and how they're going after those individuals who carry and sell these weapons. Councilman Helen Gill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I think, you know, like many of us in this room, we're all grappling with um, making sense of what's happening in our city. But I also want to reemphasize that this isn't also something new. And I think all of us are, are here recognizing about the thousands of shootings that have happened, um, that we recognize that all the data indicates that, um, that they are concentrated in certain places. Gun violence doesn't impact everybody across the city equally. It is an incredible burden on communities that are struggling with poverty, unemployment, struggling schools, um, young people who desperately need opportunities. And, you know, uh, I think one of the things that's been most striking is the number of neighborhoods that, that bear this burden that we already know about. So 10, 10 neighborhoods are 50% of the shootings. One neighborhood, both sides of Broad, both sides of Broad Street, um, in North Philadelphia account for one in five shootings. So, you know, I want to thank my chairman and also all of my colleagues who are here because I know that um, there are certain things that we know and um, there's also, uh, we're here because this is an emergency hearing. <laughs> you know, um, and while I do appreciate, I do appreciate the city, um, you know, putting forward what we are beginning to do, what we are starting to study, 
we're here to push that timeline. I mean, that's what we're here to do. We're here to, because we're interested in solutions, not just administering to a problem. Um, with all due respect, uh, you know, I don't have a ton of questions right now for, the, for my district attorney and for my police commissioner, in part because I, I hope that we don't get to focus deterrence and to the police. Uh, we cannot dump all the problems of these shootings on our police officers when so much of this is rooted in, the, in, in causes that precede and that we already know and that we have been talking about for so long about poverty and that we have to start funding the community-based programs sufficiently and to efficiency instead of like looking to the police to start you know, paying for SAT programs. This makes no sense to me. So I have a set of questions that I want to know about now. I'm here because this is this emergency hearing and we are uh, in July practically and we got young people who are out of school and we know that this impacts you know, young, young people the most. We've got 29,000 uh, young people between the ages of 18 and 24 in this city, 50% of whom are black boys. Um, they need opportunities. They need um, access to things. So here are my questions. Um, I want to know what, and, and I want to thank my colleague, Cindy Bass, but I want to know in these neighborhoods, what is the commitment for longer hours at every single library and rec center? I don't want you to tell me what the libraries and rec centers are. I want to know what the plan is for the libraries and rec centers right now. And, and I need that, this, this is not a mystery about these things, but this is something that we know. We already had a great story about a Frankfurt football coach who keeps his office open late at night on every single Friday night and everyone's clapping that, well, where's the lesson back to us? We're the city. So we don't have to do it in every single neighborhood right now, but we got to have some where we are making promises to those members that we are not only just targeting resources right now, but we are telling people right now what they can do. Because I will guarantee you that when we see this kind of an emergency and then we look at young people and we pass them in the streets and we tell them, we'll get to you. That is the surefire's way for them to turn right around and walk out the door and say, this is why I don't believe anymore. Um, and it's the same thing with the families and the parents and all the people who get impacted by violence that is so deeply crushing. I also want to know, um, right now, like we talked about the impact of blight, vacant land. Um, we heard from Commissioner Perry um, about, uh, about the, the, you know, the interest in sealing up vacant properties and movement towards that. But there's also programs that we have right now, like within the Horticultural Society, land care program, could there be emergency funds which give opportunity youth in target neighborhoods a chance to not only just seal these properties up and pretend like they don't exist, you know, like boarded up properties are not exactly fun other than vacant blighted properties. They are often the same thing. But can we give them something to like help them improve what their communities look like? Like that's, a, we, those are existing programs. I'm not asking to start anything new. But the Horticultural Society does have this land care program that puts young people to use in fixing up their neighborhoods. Is that something that the city is willing to do so that we don't just you know, seal things up and pretend that that's going to solve a problem. We have, um, we've talked about this at the school district of Philadelphia, but the imp incredibly important need for us to get a crisis response team in place. That includes grief counselors, social workers who go in. If you are a direct victim, yes, you get a chance to work with victim service agencies. What if you're not a direct victim? What if you are, um, you know, you're a child who came home, you're struggling, you're a family member, an aunt, a relative, um, or a best friend? Like those things have torn families, communities, and young people apart. How can we not have a plan for that when we, these shootings are going off in these neighborhoods and communities in a way that young people feel like it's almost routine for them? Um, so we've got. We've got uh, programs that are going on right now in our rec centers, in our libraries, in our schools, summer programs, Parks and Rec are running all these programs. Can we infuse some of those with that grief counseling, the crisis response teams, so that when these things come through, we don't leave our young people bereft with the anger, pain, and trauma that they don't have any other outreach for. They can't even explain it. I can't even explain it to them. Like, I need professional help explain some of these things. And then the last thing that I would say is like hunger's real and you know if we've got we've got food pantries, we've got people stealing for basic resources in their lives, 
turning to crime for basic resources in their lives. That we, we know the neighborhoods, we know the zip codes, we know the hot points, whatever we want to call these places. I, we already know. Tell me what's going in there and tell me when. Tell me when, because that's the most important thing for me. I got to know who, when I look a young person in the eye, what can I tell them right now, in July, this is what's coming to your neighborhood. Do we have a guaranteed jobs program for those young people through work ready? Why not? PYN is ready to go. We got, we got our business community, hire up these young people, a guaranteed work ready program for every young person in those neighborhoods most impacted. This is something that we have talked about. We've scattered it across the city. We've done experiments, we've done pilots, but why not go all in now? If this is truly the emergency that we're talking about, go all in now on the neighborhoods and communities that we know are the biggest recipients of violence and are dealing with the pain and trauma of it. We don't need more task force and trauma. Let's go all in now. Bring to Calvary, that's who we are. So help me understand, give me a timeline and tell us how we can work with you and then if we need a transfer, then let's do it because this is that emergency that we've been talking about. So fully understand and agree with many of the points that you said. Uh, I see that kind of as my role and the role of the implementation team as to try to coordinate this, which is what we're trying to do. We will go back and talk to those agencies, although we've already been in conversations with them, but in order to sort of pin to a timeline and to quantify some of the stuff that you said, which is in terms of the rec centers. I believe some of them are open later, but I would need to get you a list as to which ones and what the hours and the times are. We are already working with them uh, with some of the modest funding that we have available to try and see where we can extend programming and other things, uh, just using some of the violence prevention dollars. But it will uh, take some going back and really working on what we can do. As far as the blight stuff, I agree uh, that your environment often affects your attitude. Uh, and so some of it is about the cleaning and the greening of lots. And so those vacant lots, right. cleaning them up, trying to employ uh, young people from the community to help with that, and then putting fencing around them and other things that make them look more eye-catching. And even when we do the cleaning seals, we're also talking about putting up um, sort of a doors and window kind of facade so that it's not just the uh, basic plywood in, in terms of uh, certain neighborhoods, but all of the things you said are things that we're working on, but I do get the urgency of it and whether or not we can ratchet it up is some conversations we have to have with those individual agencies to be able to report back to you some real numbers. Yeah. So to and, be and also clear, very quickly, Council, yes, and to your yes. point, just within our purview, we, we've got 13 PAL centers that we're keeping open late, exactly. you know, in the evening and on Friday and open it up earlier on the weekend just, just to make sure that we do accomplish that for some of these young can, people. Can you state that again for the record, sir? Thirteen PAL centers that are opening or that are staying open later until 9 o'clock on the weekends and then opening up earlier on the weekend, so opening up on the weekend. So that's, that's a good thing. It's one of the things we're trying to do to play that part. Right? And just for a recommendation and support, um, because we're in a state of emergency, because I believe we're dealing with a crisis, like maybe a PR team, like that's information that should be readily available to the public. Because right. I don't think the average individual that would know that we're extending um, power center hours um, longer now, just so they'll know this is where you can take your children on the weekend. So I think that's a plus. Um, we probably need to do more to get that type of information out there to the public. Councilwoman? And, yeah, and the only thing I'll say is like, you don't have to get back to me with all the lists of things. I just need them to do, you know, to, to be open. So like by, by July 4th, I mean, this is not even the hottest part of the summer. Like, thank God yeah, the last started. couple of weeks have not been like normal days in June. But once July 4th hits, we know that those heat waves hit. We know people get frustrated. There's fewer places. Like, it's cool to go outside. That's how crazy people's housing lives are right now. You know, so like, if the rec center's air conditioned, I think p kids will go inside. I know that if schools are gonna be air conditioned and PAL centers are gonna be air conditioned, people are gonna go inside. They're gonna find refuge. No one wants, to, no one wants the violence. This is not a normal state of human condition and I'm sick and tired of people pathologizing young people like they want and crave, not that anybody here is doing it, but let's be clear, I don't want anyone cr pathologizing that this is some kind of like normal effort, of, you know, at what happens in our city, it absolutely is not. But we are not giving enough alternatives, so by July 4th, can we have some, before the July 4th recess, can we have some concrete answers 
from the city about what it's going to do. I don't want any like lists or directories or anything like that. Tell me what we're going to do. Tell me what we can promise to some of these neighborhoods and communities about what goes in place by July 5th or July 10th. But not much further. I mean, this is, if this is the emergency, then let's make something happen. Understood, but I do want to say, I think that the city has recognized the emergency. Summer camps were opened earlier this year. The pools have opened earlier this year. There are a number of programs that have started earlier as we're trying to build towards what we understand the situation in the city as is. But we will get you your answers. Yes, and I want to thank you, Ms. Harley, because I know this is a hard thing and you're, you're like kind of the recipient. But I just want to be clear, those are things that the city does anyway. And I'm looking at neighborhoods that are deeply impacted. I'm not trying to do it everywhere. I want to see Understood. where the Calvary is going to be this summer for X thousands of kids in these zip codes in these neighborhoods. Let's make them a promise that we can deliver on. Thank you. Councilwoman Cindy Bass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I just want to follow up on my earlier comments, too, just going back to the um, opening of the rec centers, um, you know, uh, having them open at a later hour. And, um, you know, as a councilwoman just mentioned, and as I had mentioned earlier, we are circulating a letter um, and gathering support to ask the administration and the commissioner uh, to not only be open, but to also have structured programming. Because, you know, we know that we, the audience that we're, we want to capture is not the uh, summer camp audience. It's not the pool going audience. The audience that we want to capture is the ones who were out late, well, you know, way past, you know, when in, into the night. Um, and a lot of those, we're, you know, to be honest, we recognize that you're not going to be able to capture everybody because some shootings are going to happen at two o'clock in the morning, some are going to happen in the early wee hours. And, um, those are not going to be people that we would attract under any circumstances, and we certainly do understand that. But what we have now, right now in the city, is really just a tale of two cities. And we've talked about this before, we talked about it during budget hearings, and you have some neighborhoods that are just completely off the hook. There is no other way to describe it except that you go into some of these neighborhoods and it feels like a war zone. And these are not new war zones. These are zones that were war zones when I was coming up. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm seasoned. You know? <laughs> so I've been around for a minute, but they have been, you know, in this city for quite some time. And the idea that we haven't gotten a handle on some of these things yet, um, you know, is troubling. But even I would say this, even as a younger person in the city, I didn't know of homicide victims probably till I was either it, way in high school or out of high school and into college. I didn't know of any victims of homicide. Young kids now all know of someone close to them. And so there's a level of trauma that's associated with that. And I think of that when I think of what Councilman Johnson was saying earlier in terms of the way, you know, the, the guns have hit the streets and hit them really hard. And so you hear about all kinds of things, the amount of artillery that's out in our neighborhoods, and it's just very, very frightening. And so I say all of that to say that, you know, I'm glad to hear that we're having the conversation about focused deterrence. Um, uh, you know, I'm glad that um, we're having the support, and I hope the organization uh, and, and strategy between the police off, the police commissioner and the district attorney and their offices, that there is the coordination, of course, uh, you as well, uh, Ms. Ms. Harley, um, that there is the level of coordination that we need because we need to be organized. You know, uh, whatever effort is happening in the street, whatever is going on in the neighborhoods, we need to be organized. That's the best way that we can combat that because if we're not organized, then all of the money we're spending, all of the work that we're doing, it's all for naught if we're not all in sync and working together. And so, um, you know, the one thing I, I did want to also mention is that there was, um, you know, just a little comment made earlier in terms of the money that was not allocated during the budget season, um, Mr. District Attorney, in terms of your budget and what was not provided. And I'm just going to say, and I can't, you know, well, actually, I'm going to speak for everybody on council and, you know, whoever can correct me, <laughs> councilman. Uh, but I'm going to speak for everybody when, when I say that I don't know of any member of council that said, we don't want to support your funding requests. 
So I don't want to leave it on the, in the hands of council as if city council did not fully support your funding request. So well, I just want to I mean, state I, I, that. I have to correct that. The, I, I am not blaming council. Please don't understand okay, that I'm, to be it. But, but we, were, we were reduced $3 million. We went in looking for three more. We got three less. We are down six from where we wanted to be. I think a lot of it comes from the fact that the city put forward a budget that had cut us three million, and there well, may have been some misunderstanding. Right. Let me be, well, let me be clear, because um, I think that, uh, and again, I'm going to speak for everyone here, we all want to make sure that our police and our district attorney's office have all of the resources that they need. We had over a $300 million surplus in the last year, and I say spend the money. Like, what are we saving money for And people are getting shot in the streets? Spend the money. And so I don't think that any one of us is trying to hold back resources to spend somewhere else when we have this public health, public you know, life and death uh, emergency situation going on. So uh, I just really wanted to be on record on that because I don't want for one second the citizens of the city of Philadelphia to feel as though we're doing anything less than making sure that they're safe at all times in all neighborhoods. So uh, I just wanted to be on record for that as well. And I, you know, I recognize that there's no one thing that's going to fix this. There are long-term solutions and there are short-term solutions. But on the short-term solutions, we have to look at the activities piece for our young people. We have to look at employment in a very challenging uh, environment. You know, we just heard today that, you know, that uh, Han Hanneman is, um, you know, talking about closing its doors. That's about 3,000 jobs and, you know, the refinery, about another 1,000 jobs. So we are in a, you know, tough situation right now. And these are the things that we have to deal with, but we have to get in front of them. And we want to certainly make sure that we support our law enforcement officials um, with the short-term solutions, including employment, activities, and supports to programs that are already on the ground working and doing anti-violence um, um, uh, work here in the city of Philadelphia. So um, that's what I had to say. And thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for your time on this matter. Last question for the panel, Councilman Mark Squilla. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. And I, I want to reiterate that about working together. Um, also, and, and the programming is important, but there also is an aspect that uh, Councilmember Bass has said that some people you're just not going to reach. So that's where policing mm -hmm. also comes into effect and, and also enforcement. We, we need to be able to know that there are some folks that are out there that sometimes are c commit these crimes, and, and we know right actually in front of the police. We have them in my district uh, over the last two weekends. We had uh, five shootings um, and in succession, Friday, Saturday, Friday, and then again last night. Um, so some of those folks are, are known to the system, some of those folks uh, we're aware of. So we also need to, to make sure that when we do have instances like that, people who are not really going to be engaged by programming, we need to make sure we have that enforcement mechanism in place to be able to, to make sure that they are not only a menace to the community, but also kept off the streets so that we can protect the people who are doing the right thing on the streets. And I think that's something else we need to work together with to make sure we do that. And um, um, we could have all the programs in the world for a lot of people, and I agree with doing that because we're gonna help a lot of folks to be able not to commit these crimes, but there's always gonna be somebody out there to do it anyway. And so that's where we, we still need to, to work together to make that happen, and thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I want to acknowledge and also have um, a few questions by Councilwoman Janie Blackwell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly, I'm very, very grateful that we're having this uh, emergency important hearing. I agree with all that has been said. And in fact, I hope that we can find a way to keep our recreation centers open a little longer. I've asked this for the last couple of years, the recreation commissioner tells me that college kids go back to school, many of them who are lifeguards, but where we can, we really need to, it seems like the pool's open and then close. Maybe in our recreation centers, we can look at that to try to see if we can't keep them open a little longer. I wanna thank both the police, our commissioner and his department and the DA's office for all that we do with victim <laughs> services. It's so important 
that we reach out to people. And we all know people who've lost children and it's so important that we work with these people because it makes all the difference in the world. Um, tonight we're having a community meeting at First Corinthian, 51st and Pine, mm -hmm. to talk about these issues. And certainly we're still hoping, uh, Commissioner, we're hoping we can get you on the 13th. They got word coming out for three hours and trying to get you. We're out there every Saturday at 41st and Lancaster, and we're hoping you can find a little time for us on that day. We got all these calls into your office. You'll know as soon as you hit it, but we are trying uh, to do our best. Everybody, I don't know, I don't, I guess none of us really understands how all this continues because everybody I know, whether they're block captains, elected officials, committeemen, town watch, everybody's fighting the issue. You know, everybody's fighting it from where they are. And that's the only thing that solved problem. Parents are fighting it. All of us are fighting it. People are fighting where drugs are sold. They're fighting those kind of institutions. They're doing what they can to help their children in, in activities. We're doing what we can to fight it. It's got to improve because if everybody does their part, life has to get better, I believe. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you very much, Councilwoman. Thank you. Thank and just you. one last question to the Department of Health head, Cheryl, just real last question for this panel. You talked about needing funding for the, um, the public campaign around, um, after, what is it called, after you shoot, now what? It's called you shoot, now what? You shoot, now what? Now, I met with the former health um, department head when this first started, right? They did a trial um, rollout of this initiative Right, and it's been very effective. Everything you talked about, um, I agree with. If we just allowed it, I think it's 31 million over a certain period of time, how come some of those fundings can't go toward your initiative? Like why would we need additional money and council just allocate a significant amount of money around violence prevention initiatives? So first one clarification, Commissioner Farley is the commissioner. He's out of town today. Oh, okay. Um, right. I had um, chronic disease order. and injury prevention. Yes. Um, so we have another source of funding that we believe will pay for it. We should know, I believe, sometime in the next month or so. Okay. Right. I just want to say for the record also, when you have that type of public campaign around the issue of violence, it plants those seeds of deterrence and seeds of hope in the public. I think right now when we have these type of hearings and us elected officials and uh, individuals who run in various departments, whether it's the district attorney's office or the Philadelphia Police Department, and we get up and say, well, overall violence is down this percent, that percent, right? That's not what the feeling is when you go outside the neighborhood. That's not what the average person tells me when I'm walking through the street separate from what the statistics may actually say, but when you're countering that with an actual public campaign, they say that we're out here on the front line, we're addressing this issue. I remember under Lynn Abel, they used to have this campaign where, I'll never forget it, you get on the bus and talk about how much time you're gonna get for carrying the gun, right? Mm -hmm. At least it plans to see that not for the guys that's gonna do it anyway, but that next generation of young people who think they might wanna be tough, on a 17 bus and they see a sign that says, after you shoot, now what? Because it really begs the question, after you shoot, really, now what? And one ad is a young man behind right. the, the prison yeah. glass with his daughter on exactly. the other side, right, which is a realistic picture. Right. The other one was a mother crying, which right. is real, and the other one is a young man getting arrested. And so whatever we need to do to wrap up that message, because I yeah. think that's the counter that we have to have out there. That we're actually out here doing our job. We're actually out here addressing this issue. And we're putting it on the forefront of everybody's minds that this is actually a priority here. We, the opioid piece, I see a million commercials about if you're drug addicted. Yeah. Every single day, I go, whoa, they got commercials about going to this treatment program and that treatment program. If we could take that same approach from a public health yeah. crisis standpoint, um, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, I just I, want to I state agree. that for the record. I agree. And we, we chose those images very intentionally after a lot of focus group discussion. 
um, not to choose blood and gore, but to choose, choose images that were very powerful. And we're, we're right now getting print versions of those out on the street. Thank you. Listen, we start at 11. It's two, and you're the first panel. Um, I do want to thank the commissioner. I want to thank you, Vanessa. I want to thank you, Sheriff. Mr. Um, Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman Cindy Bass. I know you were going to wrap up, but I just had one more quick question. I'm sorry. And I wanted to ask, um, did, did I see this morning on the news that there was a crackdown that was going to be happening on nuisance businesses as a result of the homicide that happened in Council President Clark's off, uh, death excuse, uh, in his um, district. Uh, district, I'm sorry. Um, the young woman who was killed, she was a mother of five in a uh, nuisance business. In a deli. Yeah, stop and go. Chief Inspector Joe Kelly Sullivan. So we've done a lot of work on, uh, along with Commissioner Perry and l and in the police department, obviously the health department, and pulling together, um, you know, some changes that were supposed to be happening for these businesses, which are nuisance businesses for the most part, that sell um, beer, beer, shots of liquor, um, drugs that you can convert into uh, illegal drugs to get you high, um, you know, crack pipes, all kinds of, you know, uh, material that's obviously not good for the community and, you know, causing all kinds of, uh, ha wreaking all kinds of havoc in the neighborhood. And it was our understanding that these businesses were going to be uh, closed and shuttered some time ago. We had expected that we would have, um, you know, more done. We understand that the state has stepped in and has not been as helpful as we had hoped. But it's, is it correct? Is my understanding correct that there is going to be more enforcement from the police department to close these businesses? Absolutely, Councilwoman. Fantastic. And for the record, my name is Deputy Commissioner Joe Sullivan. Uh, I command patrol operations. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman. Good um, afternoon. Councilwoman, you are absolutely right. Um, the amount of cooperation that we receive, Commissioner Perry, is just absolutely outstanding when it comes to problem businesses, licensed liquor establishments, and the latest uh, problem that we're confronting with, uh, with hookah lounges and their ability to operate as um, basically um, speakeasies. Mm -hmm. um, the cooperation between his office and the Pennsylvania State's Police uh, Liquor Control Enforcement, um, we have seen some substantial results. Now, what you're, you're speaking of to that tragic incident inside that deli, an example of that is the, the staff inspectors that are assigned to both chief inspectors within uh, the within the patrol bureau, uh, uh, Chief Inspector Holmes and Chief Inspector Dales, uh, Dales, Chief Inspector Dales is here today. His staff inspector, Bologna, was working very closely with l and I, and yesterday they did shut down 2248 Ridge Avenue, and that has been a location where we have received numerous complaints from the community, and that is just the beginning of an initiative in the 22nd District, which will, those, which will continue citywide to address the type of concerns that you're raising here. Well, I have a long list, so I'd be happy to share my list with you. Please I think share you that with me, ma'am. Yeah, well, okay, well, I thought we had shared it with you before. We'd be happy to put it back together for you again if you need it. Um, but we have a number of establishments, including one. And I want to actually give a shout-out to my captain, Anthony Ginaldi, in the 39th District, um, who has been just really responsive with a problem business at a takeout restaurant, which is at uh, in the Broaden Hunting Park uh, intersection right next to a gas station that has had just numerous complaints. I mean, it's just ridiculous. If you go by there right now, there's a whole bunch of people standing around. We and have, so we have problems with our. I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am, not to interrupt you. We have problems with narcotics enforcement out there. We have had far too many incidents of gun violence yes. out there, and yes. much of it is being driven by the drug trade, um, yes. which our narcotics bureau has made significant inroads in but also um, businesses that, that do operate outside the law and do things mm -hmm. that, they, that attract the wrong type of people. And I know that um, both uh, Captain Rodriguez in the 25th District and Captain Ginaldi in the 39th, since they share the problem, mm -hmm. have been uh, very aggressive in addressing yes. all those issues, and we've gotten outstanding help from the Commissioner of License and Inspections. Well, we, you know, we were out at um, that location back for an event at another uh, place down the street back in um, uh, April and approached one of the young men who was standing around and asked, you know, like, why are you here? You know, why, why is everybody just hanging around here all of the time? And he said, well, we don't have any place else to go. We don't have anything else to do. And so, you know, we had a conversation with him 
and um, it wasn't more than a week later that there was a homicide at that location uh, with a young man who was shot and killed. I don't know who was shot and killed, but there was a homicide at that location. I, I don't even think it was a week later. And so, you know, these are the kind of tragedies that we're dealing with that, you know, again, if we're able to, you know, open up some facilities, maybe on a, a warm Saturday night, which this was, we would be able to attract some of these young people into some of those facilities. So, um, but again, I just wanted to also thank the captain of the 39th, Anthony, Anthony Ginaldi, and also uh, Captain Smith from the 14th District and Captain Ransom from the 35th District, who are all great partners in helping us with uh, the work we need to do in our neighborhood. So. I'll thank be happy you. to pass that along, man. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank you for your time and thank you for um, your testimony today. Thank you very much. Can the clerk call, please call the last panel, please? Brendan O'Malley, Faustino Castro Jimenez, George Mosey. I want to go in this direction. Um, Brandon, I would like to, for you to start, and then um, Faustino Castro Jimenez, I would like for you to go next, and then I would like for George um, to wrap us up, because um, all of your testimony uh, is, is part of a comprehensive um, approach from the law enforcement standpoint um, to dealing with the juveniles from the enforcement standpoint but also just wrapping it up from the community intervention um, standpoint as well. And so I want to ask um, for Brandon to please start with your testimony. Thank you very much, Councilman Johnson, and I thank the committee for the important work that it performs. As you mentioned, my name is Brendan O'Malley. I'm the Chief Deputy Attorney General. I'm here representing Attorney General Josh Shapiro and the Gun Violence Task Force. My counterpart in the DA's office is Jude Conroy. As was mentioned before, he is unable to be here today. Can you speak and, into the microphone more? Sure. But I am joined by Assistant Supervisor in the DA's office, J.T. Tartikoff. I was a city prosecutor from 2003 to 2015, and five of those years were spent in the homicide unit, so I am acutely aware of the profound effects that illegal guns have on our community. I'm here to update you on the work of the task force. The Gun Violence Task Force is a joint state and local task force that focuses its resources on straw purchase investigations, origin of crime guns, and conducts large-scale investigations into violent criminal organizations in our neighborhoods. It's funded by the state. It is comprised of state agents and Philadelphia assistant district attorneys and our primary mission is to investigate how guns illegally get on the streets. We also aggressively prosecute background check violations to ensure prohibited persons do not possess firearms. And we also conduct large scale criminal investigations into groups that use firearms. In this task force, the Attorney General and the DA work closely with the Philadelphia Police and our federal partners in the ATF and FBI in identifying and prosecuting gun traffickers, straw purchasers, and shooters. Recently fully staffed with two full squads of state agents and seven ADAs, there has been a sharp increase in productivity, including a 40% increase in guns recovered by our agents in 2018 and a significant increase in open cases in the last year. Our agents are embedded with the Philadelphia Police Detective Divisions, and we are lucky to not only have experienced agents, but an excellent group of ADAs and supervisors in the unit that run the day-to-day -day operations of the task force. Not only does our unit work closely with federal law enforcement agencies, but we enjoy an excellent working relationship with the Violent Crimes Unit of the United States Attorney's Office. 
in which three of our ADAs and myself are cross-designated and sworn in as special assistant United States attorneys to prosecute the most violent and complex cases in federal court. I want to briefly update you on some of the major initiatives that have taken place since my last testimony in June of 2018. Councilman, as you know, in February 2018, at the request of commanders in the Philadelphia Police Department, our task force conducted an investigation into ongoing gang violence in South Philadelphia that branched out to Southwest and Northwest Philadelphia. This violence was primarily between two rival groups and increased greatly in 2017 and early 2018. An assistant district attorney was assigned to review and conduct the investigation along with myself and agents from the Attorney General. Through the use of what are called NIBIN reports, which are generated by the ATF, social media posts, surveillance video, and other evidence, it became clear that a select group of individual firearms were being used at well over 40 shootings and homicides throughout the city of Philadelphia. These shootings were also linked through forensic cell phone evidence to two main rival gangs at 27th and 31st Street. As a result of the investigation and a year-long grand jury, arrests were made on March 6, 2019. Nine individuals associated with gangs on both sides of this conflict were arrested, including two charged with the shooting death of a teenager at 27th and Dickinson. Recovered during arrests and searches were four firearms, two of which are connected to shootings already linked to the ongoing gang war. All of the charges were held for court. They now await trial dates, and all offenders are detained in county prison as we believe they present a threat to themselves and others. Assisting in that investigation was the Juvenile Probation Unit, Philadelphia Police Detective Divisions, the ATF, U.S. Marshals, and the FBI. As a result of this operation, a majority of the main violent crime drivers were arrested and shootings between those two groups groups fell dramatically. Shootings, which had previously been occurring at a rate of multiple times a day over a series of months in 27 and 18, slowed to a trickle after the grand jury presentment. There were no shootings for over a month after the arrests in the target area, and shootings remain low with just two incidents that we are currently able to connect to the conflict. But we are really just beginning. A new grand jury has been impaneled, the investigations into the unsolved shootings and homicides in South Philadelphia continue. And due to the Philadelphia Police Department requesting our assistance, we have expanded our investigation into a target area of West Philadelphia. With these limited resources, our task force is effective, effectively prosecuting high value targets that are brought to us by the Philadelphia Police Department. I wanna switch gears briefly and talk about our Kensington Initiative. In August of, 20, uh, August of 2018, the AG's office, in collaboration with the FBI, Philadelphia Police, and SEPTA Police, launched the Kensington Initiative to address violent crime associated with the opioid epidemic. Our drug unit and task force worked closely with the FBI to develop a strategy to use intelligence to address the most violent and prolific drug corners in the Fairhill section of Kensington. What is unique about this initiative is not only the intelligence-led effort targeting violent crime drivers and the collaboration between the FBI, AG's office, and Philly police, but after each operation, there is a focus on servicing the community in the target area by working with the managing director's office to surge resources, hold community meetings, and ensure the neighborhood is equipped to hold on to the gains we made as a result of the law enforcement operation. Our goal in this initiative is simple, give those corners back to the neighbors. After two successful operations, we look forward to having another major impact by dismantling another violent organization this summer. The final thing I wanna update you on, Councilman, is our efforts for comprehensive tracing of crime guns in the state of Pennsylvania. We've discussed this briefly before, but the AG's office is working closely with the ATF and state police to enhance intelligence sharing. As you may or may not know, it is actually state law that every crime gun recovered in the state of Pennsylvania must be reported to the ATF and the state police. We 
are urging all departments in Pennsylvania to closely track and trace their crime guns and opt into what's called collective data sharing. As you know, Councilman, these guns have no borders. How they come into our city, there are less than 10 gun dealers in the city of Philadelphia. There's over 2,600 in the state. We understand this effort extends well beyond the borders of Philadelphia, and the AG is building an innovative approach to integrate federal, state, and local efforts to trace and investigate crime guns. One facet of this program is what I mentioned before, the ATF's NIBIN program. In essence, it is tracking every gun leaves a fingerprint, every shell casing leaves a fingerprint, and it's important that all of that data be uploaded to the ATF so they can share it with major and local police departments because there could be a shooting in Chester that's linked to a gun in Philadelphia and it would never be known unless that is shared through the NIBIN program. We are pressing local agencies to use all resources at their disposal and information share to allow us to target the source of illegal guns across all of our communities. In addition to working with law enforcement, we are also working closely with our partners in the city and community groups like Ceasefire PA, Temple University, the Health Department, my mother's in charge, to formulate a way to target the most vulnerable community that is subject to straw purchasing. We, to your point, there was a program when there was a five-year mandatory for carrying a crime gun in Pennsylvania, we seek to work with local group and mothers in charge to have a similar public outreach program to teach people the dangers of straw purchasing and the dangers of what happens when an illegal transfer ends up in the wrong hands. Only law enforcement can deal with the after effects of this violence but community outreach must meet that intersection before the at-risk behavior occurs to ensure people know the dangers of gun trafficking in our neighborhoods. In order to produce a thousand foot view of gun trafficking in our state, all of our local and federal partners must collaborate. The Attorney General looks forward to taking a leadership role in coordinating those agencies and their efforts to reduce the gun violence that profoundly affects Philadelphians every day. We can do better, and we will do better. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Castro. <clears throat> Thank you for the record. Uh, my name is Faustino Castro Jimenez. I am the Chief of Probation for Juvenile Division. Uh, with me are Paul Visa. He is the Director of YVRP for our Warrant Unit. And also Joseph Cockrell. He is the Director for our Juvenile Enforcement Team, and hopefully uh, you allow us the opportunity for them to share a little bit about the enforcement piece yes. in terms of juvenile probation. Mm -hmm. so, so good afternoon, Councilman Johnson and members of the Special Committee on Gun Violence. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify on this incredibly important issue that creates havoc in families, trauma, and despair, and that ultimately tears at the fabric of our communities. Although probation's jurisdiction limits our capabilities to youth under court order supervision between the ages of 10 and 21, we are working with system partners to address issues within our purview that can give youth a fighting chance to reach their potential. Too often do I receive reports where youth under supervision are perpetrators of shooting or have been victims of retaliation. Some of these shootings involve youth, may be attributed to social media posts where youth may feel disrespected by others, as you mentioned earlier. Some shootings are as a result of fights originating at the school level and later pouring into our communities. Some can be attributed to generation, the generational feuds, small factions, blocks, groups, or cliques that have been in confrontation with each other for years. This cycle of young lives cut short, understandably alarms our collective conscience and must stop so that the healing can start. Juvenile probation is committed to being part of the conversation, and we enjoy the full support of our judicial administration to assist us in this endeavor. Our young people face many challenges today, but they are resilient, and I am convinced that significant majority of young people 
irrespective of the fact that they may be on supervision, can certainly benefit from proper guidance. So what is juvenile probation doing? So I want to share a couple of things in terms of the preventive measures that we're trying to accomplish. Number one, we've met with representatives from the school district to proactively streamline our communication process for incidents that may spill over into our, into our communities. What we have recognized is a lot of the issues that are happening in communities, on top, and especially for school-age kids, happening in school, we don't know about the beef that is going on, spill into communities, and all of a sudden we get shootings, kids shooting each other for minor things. Sometimes we have realized that if we would have intervened in time with the school district, communicating with them, we may have prevented a shooting from happening in our communities. Therefore, what we also wanted to do is to assure that youth under supervision who were victims of shooting, we would establish a process whereby trauma efforts were coordinated among agencies, school district, of Philadelphia probation, counseling services would be offered, and that the necessary supports would be in place for our youth. Number two, Along with the support from state and local DHS, we will be increasing our capacity for GA, GPS that track our high-risk youth in the communities under strict supervision. Also, with their support, an RFP is being developed to create an additional evening reporting centers. Now, this is important here. We have two evening reporting centers. Both are actually working. One is used for an alternative to placement, with a GPS component. One is used for a pre-adjudicatory. These are the kids that are awaiting adjudicatory hearings. We place them on GPS, but we monitor them in their communities because we want to make sure that they are protected, but we also want to make sure that the communities are protected, so we follow them. But in these, in these evening reporting centers, they offer cognitive behavioral therapies, they offer academic supports, they offer um, music choices, um, they offer job also training and coaching. They offer a lot of things that will benefit those soft skills that benefit our youth in the future. So what we're trying to do is develop an, an ERC, an aftercare evening reporting center for those specific youth that are coming down from residential placement. Youth that are 17 to 21, that's our highest risk population. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to assure that the recidivism rate for these particular youth that we know are the ones that are shooting out there or also are victims of shooting, those particular youth are actually coming back from residential placements and are in a structured care <coughs> where they can receive all the supports and services that they can transition successfully from probation supervision. So, so I was, I'm, I'm gonna let you finish your testimony, but um, you know, the first panel kind of gave an overview of some of the things that the city is doing um, this is at the heart of what I see on a daily basis because we're talking about juveniles. Yes. A lot of shooters are the babies yes. that's carrying the guns in the neighborhoods, and those are the ones who are also losing their lives um, in the neighborhood. And so um, that's just something critical that you, you just touched on because the typical age of a shooter and the one who, who, who's more likely to be killed or be shot, right, starting from a juvenile age up until that 21, 22 type. <clears throat> and, it and you're absolutely right, Councilman. And it escalates from there. So we want to stop the pipeline. We are always looking to stop the pipeline. And so we also recognize that ERCs have a specific function. And this is what the function is, is that we recognize that between the hours of 4 and 12, our youth are more prone to be involved in delinquent behavior and are more prone also to uh, be involved in activities that we deem are risk, risky activities, high risk activities. So hopefully by having this in place, we will d diminish and decrease the number of youth that are actually transitioning out of state placements into these structures, ERC, and then hopefully out of probation supervision and hopefully with jobs. And in, in reference to jobs, so point number three, with grant support from PCCD and the Juvenile Court Judges Commission, we have embarked in the Second Chance Act which offers our older population returning from state secure placements the opportunity to find meaningful employment. We have contracted with PHMC, who is utilizing a jobs coordinator to work with our community employment partners. One of the, there's two main indicators that can predict juvenile delinquency. One is school. Is a child attending school? Is a child at school? Is a child missing school? And why, right? 
The second is jobs. For some reason, if a youth is gainfully employed, if he has some type of sustainable employment within the ages of 17 and 21, that youth is more likely or less likely to be involved in delinquent or criminal behavior. So the Second Chance Act, I think, is an important program because it focuses on our older population again, because that is our focus. That is our drive to reduce that type of child that we know can and will be involved in this, in this type of behavior. And so, so these are the things, Councilman, that we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to be proactive about we're working with the school district. We've had meetings with them in terms of certain issues with them. Um, but, but I think a lot of things that we can be proactive on in terms of working with, uh, with PAN. I know George Mosley, we've worked for a long time in terms of YBRP. I'm going to ask one of my directors to speak on that. But uh, there are certain things that we can be proactive on and try to be proactive, and we have been proactive on. And hopefully these are the things that, over time, will decrease the number of kids being shot because it is alarming at this particular time. And I think that we can make an impact. And so I'm willing to have that conversation. And I know our judicial administration is willing to have that conversation. And so hopefully we can continue to partner on this. So thank you uh, for allowing me to testify, Councilman. And I would ask my uh, JET directors just to finish their presentation. Thank you. Sir, so just state your name and your title for the record, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Joseph Cockerell, I'm the director uh, with the Juvenile Probation Department, uh, Juvenile Enforcement Team. Good afternoon, Chair Jones um, and the members of the Special Committee on, Committee on Gun Violence Prevention. Uh, as I said, I am the director of the Juvenile Enforcement Team, and I'm here today just to briefly discuss uh, the two specialized units within the department, which are tasked specifically with combating youth violence. The Juvenile Enforcement Team, commonly referred to as JET, and the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership. For the Juvenile Enforcement Team, uh, it's a juvenile probation-driven task force consisted, consisting of selected members of the Juvenile Probation Department's Armed Officer Program and members of the Philadelphia Police Department. Uh, JET operates citywide with a focus on high-risk juvenile offenders and juvenile gang uh, and or juvenile and gang violence within the city of Philadelphia in an attempt to decrease violent crimes and recidivism. Efforts are concentrated in areas uh, that, are indi that indicate a rise in juvenile violence and shootings. The specific goal of the JET unit is to devise and implement a proactive, a proactive and strategic plan of action to assure the safety of youth who fall under the court supervision and also that of the community as it relates again to juvenile and gang violence. Uh, JET reaches these goals through intensive investigations and intelligence collections, which is a little bit different than the rest of the probation department is known to operate. Through the use of various, uh, a variety of investigative tools, we are able to monitor youth who are on probation along with their known associates. We review the daily citywide police reports, uh, including every shooting victim in the city, specifically all shooting victims who fall under the age of 21 in coordination with the Philadelphia Police Department Criminal Intelligence Bureau. We identify these individuals and we monitor all juvenile gun offenders. Uh, we conduct interviews of all juvenile probation shooting victims and their family members, as well as um, identify juveniles who uh, appear to be involved in gang activity. The JET unit does not carry a caseload, which uh, differentiates us from traditional units. Rather, our job is, to, um, is more of an investigative role and an enforcement role uh, as it relates, again, to the safety of the youth who are identified at risk and that of the community. Mm. <laughs> the YVRP unit um, is the other component of this armed officer program. Um, the YVRP unit is part, as you know, is part of a multi-agency effort aimed at reducing youth homicide by focusing on youth 14 to 24 who are most at risk to kill or be killed. Um, again, as you know, this program is a collaborative effort within the Philadelphia Offices of Adult and Juvenile Probation, the Philadelphia Police Department, the Office of the District Attorney, and uh, the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network. YVRP juvenile probation officers identify high-risk youth 
provide intensive probation supervision, and provide intensive surveillance in the designated area of areas and within certain Philadelphia police districts. Uh, with a recent expansion that is underway, YVRP currently focuses on six police districts. However, we'll expand to 12 police districts uh, as of September of this year. So in total, between both units, the Juvenile Probation Department has allocated um, a total of 19 sworn officers, probation officers, and one analyst within these two armed units, uh, specifically designated to work with the most at-risk offenders. Um, five of which of these probation officers have been dedicated to operations at the Delaware Valley Intelligence Center, uh, referred to as the DIVIC, for intelligence gathering and information sharing purposes. In accomplishing these goals, um, both units collaborate either in a formal or informal basis and have a good working relationship with the following offices. The, Pen uh, the Office of the Attorney General, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia Police Department, Philadelphia Adult Probation and Parole Department, Corrections, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, Pennsylvania State Police, uh, various federal agencies, as well as other local and bordering police jurisdictions. Thank you. Mr. George Mosey. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm honored to serve as the executive director for the Philadelphia Anti-Drug and Events Network. I'm happy to report that this marks the 30th anniversary of PAN. Uh, that means that we've been around for 30 years uh, doing just what our name intimates, trying to stop violence and trying to make sure that young people and other people as well don't abuse drugs. Um, the interesting thing about our program is that we make house calls. Uh, I've heard from several of the people who've testified and based on some of the questions that have been asked, uh, people recognize that sometimes there's a dilemma uh, with regard to matching people who need the resources most with the resources. Uh, resources exist in this city, but sometimes the people who need them the most aren't able to access them because they don't know about it. The Philadelphia Anti-Drug Anti-Violence Network uh, does what I believe is necessary in order to solve that dilemma. Uh, I often say that sometimes a helping hand has to be attached to a very long arm. And so we are that long arm. We go into the communities that are hit hardest by violence. Uh, and those are invariably the communities that are hit hardest by poverty and economic deprivation. Um, we take the resources to them because we're talking about people who may not come to a community meeting, uh, people who wouldn't be in council chambers for this hearing. Uh, and so you'll see our vans all over the city. We have two programs that are primarily responsible for the anti-violence efforts of the Philadelphia Anti-Drug Anti-Violence Network. You've heard about the Youth Violence Reduction Partnership. Our role is we have what we call youth partner advocates who work individually with young people who have been deemed to be the most likely to kill or be killed in the city. And when they work with them, they don't just work with that individual young person uh, who range from ages 14 through 24 and even older because we never cut anybody loose but we work with their families. We work with their siblings. We work with the parents. We work with their neighbors. And in fact, we encourage them to engage in any of the programs that we have available for the youth partners. Uh, that program currently assists about 600 young people who have been so designated. And that's an approach that um, by nature requires that we identify the right young people. That's not an exact science, but we do a pretty good job with it, working in conjunction with our partners from the DA's office, probation, and the Philadelphia Police Department. But the genesis of PAN actually involved a program called the Crisis Intervention Network. And crisis wasn't relegated to individual clients. Their client was the community. I'm happy to say that through the efforts of the Office of Violence Prevention and this council, uh, PAN now has such an entity, the Crisis Intervention Network. And 
we call it the Community Crisis Intervention Network, which follows the model established by the old Crisis Intervention Network, which in large part is credited with ending turf gang warfare in the city of Philadelphia. And they did it by working with the police department, with the DA's office, but most importantly, by working with the people in the community. And so we're once again working with the community. We're once again uh, viewing the community as our client. And what that means is that we're not reacting to uh, the condition of someone who's already in the system. We're actually in a position to proactively go into a neighborhood, uh, work with after identifying the viable leadership to identify young people who may not be making the right choices, but who, when given an alternative, would make the right choice. And so our Community Crisis Intervention Program, which currently includes 15 credible messengers who go into the toughest areas of Philadelphia, seeking out young people and anyone who wants to change the course of their life. And they don't go in just with good news, they go in with resources. They're armed with substantive opportunities for people to make a different choice. Um, at this point, um, we're in a position, again, because of the actions of this council and the Office of Violence Prevention, to expand that operation. Um, beginning in July, we'll be able to service an additional district during the evenings. Uh, currently, the crisis intervention teams are on the street from six in the evening to four in the morning, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We're gonna add a team that will service the 15th district. We're also gonna add six individuals to work the crisis approach during the daylight hours. Now certainly six people can't cover the whole city. So what we envision doing is responding to particular crises as they occur and to work in a coordinated way with the evening teams. So I'm excited about what we'll be able to bring to the table, but um, in closing, I have to emphasize what I always say to folks. It's the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network, and the most important word is network. So we work with everybody. Thank you very much. So I had a couple of questions for each one of my panelists, and I'll also have my colleagues ask questions as well. Um, I wanted to start with Brandon O'Malley, and I just want to first and foremost um, thank you for, for your leadership um, around the um, Gun Violence Task Force with the Office of the District Attorney, as well as um, Josh, our Attorney General Josh Shapiro. I'm probably a little different than most individuals because although I want to get to the root cause, of why violence is taking place in the communities, but I also um, look at the law enforcement component, um, tracking down where the guns are coming from, going against the guys who can care less that we're having this hearing today. And it's individuals who can care less when I'm doing a Peace Not Guns march in the neighborhood. It's individuals who can care less when I have a job fair in the neighborhood and I'm just having a frank conversation with you because that's where I come from. So I recognize that there's some individuals, no matter how much hard work that we do to save our communities, there's some that want to be a part of the problem. And if we don't admit that, then we're fooling ourselves. And when you come from that environment, and again, my family still live in South Philly, I still live in South Philadelphia, and I have some friends that just, I won't say friends, I just know some people who just may say, Councilman, that's cool what you're doing. This is where I'm at, I'm gang gang, this is what I'm about. And so before, when I'm ready to change my lifestyle, I reach out to you. So my first priority is to make sure uh, children are safe when they go to and from the store. Children are safe when they go to and from school. My seniors are safe when they go to and from church, when they go to and from the store. And overall, the families in my district are safe. And so I do pay particular attention to um, the work that our gun violence task force does because we know for a fact there's only a small fraction of individuals who are doing the majority of the mm -hmm. shootings mm -hmm. in our neighborhood. And when you get little Boo Boo off the corner or Ron Ron who's been shooting up everybody, and next you know the whole summer is quiet. And I also speak for family members who have lost 
loved ones the gun violence because they want closure and the work that you do is so significantly important as well as all of the work but I pay attention to how we're tracking where the guns are coming from and actually going after the guys who just that's what they do in terms of um, shooting up our neighbors and so uh, let's talk about the level of staff that you have in terms of um, covering um, in the Philadelphia region I know you're, you do work the Attorney General covers the state as a whole. Correct. But let's talk about the city of Philadelphia just in general in terms of staffing levels, um, the amount of cases that you guys have to actually target to go after. I know there was a recent indictment of some individuals that you talked about, which I, and that whole neighborhood is quiet now. It's, I haven't heard anything happening in Grays Ferry, maybe one or two small things. But nevertheless, just give us an update on, on in terms of the level of manpower that's utilized in terms of the work that you're doing? So on the uh, attorney general side, as of April 2019, we are finally fully staffed with two complements of nine agents each in two squads. And those nine, uh, it was 18 agents, are embedded in the six detective divisions across the city. And they are primarily responsible for looking into every crime gun that is recovered in the city. Now, as you know, there's anywhere from 3,500 to 5,000 crime guns in the city. We open, and as I had indicated before, our productivity is up, but it will look like in this calendar year, we'll probably open about 600 cases. So it's a, a small portion of the guns that are recovered that we actually are able to open cases on with, with the limited resources that we have. In terms of the DA side of the house, as I had mentioned before, seven DAs primarily focused on the day-to-day -day straw purchases and background check violations. But to your point, what we've been able to do is expand the uh, larger investigations, the use of the grand jury, we have several agents that are also task force officers with the FBI, United States Marshal Service. So we are, we'd like to do more with more resources, but what right now we are fully staffed at our levels and that allows us to handle the day-to-day -day crime guns that come in. And we primarily split that with the Philly Police Department Gun Violence Reduction Task Force. And our DAs are able to handle those caseloads. As I mentioned before, they also have a caseload in uh, the Eastern District of Pennsylvania with federal cases. So some of our cases are also being handled down there by our specially designated DAs. But we also have two assistant district attorneys that are able to run on these larger scale investigations, which as you know, are extremely successful at targeting to your point, the very limited amount of crime drivers that are shooting and they're getting shot. Pretty much everyone that we had arrested in our initiative in March was either getting shot at or was actually physically shot leading up to the months of, of the arrest. So we are having a fair amount of uh, success with those larger scale organizations and the larger scale investigations. But unfortunately, we are not the major trials unit. We don't have 30 DAs. We're not the homicide unit. We, we don't have the capacity to, to handle a large volume of cases. But I think that in many ways that helps us to be more selective and target the worst of the worst drivers in, in each of these neighborhoods. And uh, talk about the level of support. I know the U.S. Attorney's Office has stepped up their efforts to be involved in violent crime that's taking place here in the city of Philadelphia. How are they supplementing the efforts of what you're actually doing now? So they are adopting a lot more cases, as you may have, have heard. They are communicating directly with the detective divisions and the special investigation units. We are in constant contact with the, the chief of the violent crimes unit regarding cases that are worthy of, of prosecution. I'm currently assigned to a case in which an individual was arrested with an unserialized AR-15, an AR-15 ghost gun, and four pistols, two of which were modified to be fully automatic. So those are the types of individuals which we can get long prison sentences 
to keep the public safe. It's an unfortunate, as you know, and as has been said before today, it's an unfortunate fact that there are certain individuals that just cannot be on the street as a danger to themselves or others. And uh, we, we are seeing the effects of a more robust uh, U.S. Attorney program focusing on gun violence. And as I had indicated before, currently uh, in our unit, there are four people that are special assistant U.S. attorneys with a fifth in the pipeline. And we, we actually look forward to expanding that program and possibly having two full-time deputy attorney generals that are assigned to the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and handling nothing but gun cases. Is there a database that tracks individuals who are who have been arrested for carrying guns? I would say that the, that would primarily be the responsibility of the DIVIC, and we, we would not as prosecutors uh, do that, but we work closely with the DIVIC to understand and see individuals that have been arrested multiple times for gun possession. Okay, I would refer that to um, Commissioner Ross as well, but I just wanted to ask that question. And uh, Mr. George Mosey, just give me an, uh, an update. I know the uh, paying crisis team has been up I think for roughly a year now. I'm just giving an update on uh, what you think has been the uh, most effective um, of your team that works from 6 to 4 a.m. in the morning. They've been out with myself addressing homicides, just doing outreach inside the community. Give us an update on where your team is at. Um, but also I have some questions regarding um, their presence from a strategy standpoint when they're out in the community. I'm, I was doing a or on your block session, that's when I come out and talk to the residents, and I, say, and I always talk about this particular program, and a young lady just challenged me and said, well, where? Where are they? Um, when do they come through South Philadelphia if they're assigned in the area? And to be quite frank with you, I didn't have a response other than, I know they come out when I call them, when there's a homicide, they always come out and go out in the street with me, but when the average person said, well, where's this crisis team at? And, in the 17th Police District Councilman, how do I respond? Well, I guess you have to point out the reality that the team is comprised of three people. South Philly is a big area. You know, you try to get from the first to the 17th, depending on traffic, could take you an hour and a half. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, maybe it isn't. But three people trying to cover all that ground. We small in South Philly. The first to 17th is like two blocks away yeah. from each other. Just joking. Yeah. Actually, it's about five blocks. Snyder to or I mean Snyder to, to I mean Oregon to Federal. But go ahead. I'm just yeah. joking. So it, it, it's very difficult for me to say that that person that you spoke to should have seen them. They're working from six to four in the morning. You know, maybe that person isn't out from six to four in the morning. In fact, that's one of the things that we have to analyze. You know, maybe that's a good time if you're talking about making contact with the people who want to make bad choices. Maybe it's not the best time to meet with the viable leadership of the community. And so, as I indicated earlier, I'm very happy that the Office of Violence Prevention and this council have seen fit to provide funding for daytime staff um, who can go to the meetings uh, I mean, if, if we convene at the Philadelphia Anti-Drug Anti-Violence Network at 6 o'clock when the shift starts, we finally hit the road at, say, uh, 6.45, 7 o'clock. By the time we get to the community, it's already 7.30. A lot of people are off the street. You know, and they're out there you know, canvassing, meeting with folks, responding to incidents that happen, going to the hospitals. Well, the vast majority of the people are not going to interact with them considering where they go and the time that they're there. Um, I, I do believe, however, that um, we are known. Uh, I think that one of the key partners is the police department. And I believe that if you would ask your captains in South Philadelphia, uh, like the captains in West Philadelphia, they all know us. And I think we've done a really excellent job of developing a rapport with the department. They recognize that, you know, we're not uh, stumbling over one another. We're not trying to do their job, uh, but they recognize that we serve uh, a role, that we function in a capacity that they can't. 
And so to that extent, it's mutually beneficial. Just one brief recommendation. And again, I know the great work that um, your team has been doing because oftentimes when there's a homicide in the neighborhood and I'm out talking to neighbors, the first group I call to ask to help back me up and support me is Pan. And after graduation, um, party was shot up last week in Southwest Philadelphia. It was Pan who um, walked the streets with me and talked to the neighbors. And a lot of times they say, what are you doing these, these marches or these walks for? It's not for the television show. It's not for um, any fame. It's about letting the residents know that they are not out here alone. Right. It's letting them know that they won't be hostages inside their own home. And we had so many young people out at the last event from an organization called NOMO, and they brought up a whole bunch of young people out to participate. Um, and the point is, so that next generation of young people that's about something positive, they can recognize that they're being supported as well, and just not the bad guys are running the street, shooting up everybody and everything in sight. And so um, we do thank your team from that aspect. But I would recommend with your daytime team, most community meetings take place about six o'clock. Have a representative there to talk about the work that the crisis intervention team is doing, what PAN is doing, the services that y'all offer that can help get these young guys off the street. I just think that makes the organization much stronger and will be supportive from a support standpoint on our end um, as well. And so before I turn it over to my colleague, my last question to Mr. Castro is, um, you said there's gonna be three ERC centers that's one of the where those centers are going to be. Um, two, I like the focus between 4 to 12 because a lot of times we talk about the after school hours. What is it? 3 to 6, right? When the reality is um, 4 to 12, that's when the young guys out there up to doing any and everything. And so um, when you talk about that time frame, I think that's critically important as well because, I mean, the last shooting that happened in my district, at about 7 o'clock in the afternoon, 23rd or more, right? And it wasn't dark outside. Um, and then a the week before that, out in front of Masjid, it was after a Jumar service, right? In the middle of the daytime. So that daytime period, particularly around 4 to 12, is always um, a good targeting area. But where are the three ERC centers are going to be? So currently there are two evening reporting centers. But... There are two new ones that are being created, which is the aftercare ERC, and basically a second one, which, which is an interventional ERC, as a um, alternative to placement. Um, the RFP is being developed, and hopefully by year's end, we will have something completed and will be put out uh, by the Department of Human Services who support our efforts in terms of our, our resources. And so that is my hope that by the end of the year, these two will be, and then we will have contractors who will bid for um, for these services. What's the percentage of young people under the JET program or AVRP who are um, on probation for um, carrying guns? What's your number, percentage number? So, Councilman, I can get you that number. Um, I know we track that number in terms of the kids that get adjudicated delinquent on VUFA charges or on violation of Uniform Firearms Act. Um, so we can get that number for you. I know we've tracked that in the past, and, and, and possibly we can uh, provide you yeah, that will That would be statistics. very, very helpful if yes. you provide that information. Yes. Councilman Helen Gill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my question is for Mr. Castro Jimenez, and it's, it's, great, uh, it's great to have you here. I really appreciate it. I mean, I think that the council, uh, our chairman and myself, have been heavily invested in um, the youth that are exiting from residential treatment because we believe that, especially for them, uh, when we talk about uh, gun violence in our city, we talk about young people at risk. They're among the highest. One of the reasons we've been so aggressive about going after uh, some of the facilities and making sure that they do right by our young people is because they come home to us, you know, and if they are experiencing violence, they are getting poor educational programming in those facilities where we send them for should be a short term, but sometimes ended up ends up being for years, then we have a bigger problem on our hands when they come back here. Um, so I'm really interested in your work. Um, and uh, in particular, um, 
I wanted to ask about uh, your, your comments about the School District of Philadelphia and who you normally deal with and why, what are the barriers that you think that you have in terms of uh, working with school districts? Um, and I'm curious about whether you think the barriers are mostly at the 440 level, like are they at the district level, or are you having problems with the individual schools where the young people go back to? Thank you for the question, Councilwoman. So um, I've been working, what well, we've been working, probation has been working with uh, Rachel Holtzman, and uh, she is a representative of the school district. I believe she's the deputy chief is her official title. Um, we've been having preliminary meetings in terms of uh, the coordination, collaboration, and uh, how do we support youth that actually have been shot in communities and youth uh, that actually are in school systems and are duly supervised by us and by the school district as well. So in, in terms of barriers, we have not had barriers because we just started this conversation and we are sharing information. We are also sharing information in terms of the liaison with the police uh, that is stationed at the school district. And so uh, my hope is that we can increase the information sharing because as we increase information sharing, we realize that some of these issues that are uh, are germane to the school district are also germane to us because it's our population. It's yeah, our kids. Absolutely. It's our I mean, kids. I, I'll say this, you know, Rachel Holtzman has come out of the general counsel's office. She generally tends to take a legal pro approach. She's not an educator. She's not a psychologist. She's not, you know, there's a number of things that she has a great skill set in, but that would not be it. My guess is, is that you're interested in how the young people adapt once they're in school, not about what laws and rules they follow or break. That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. So I would then be interested in, in making sure that you do connect with um, the school district's Office of School Supports. Um, you should definitely be connecting with academic supports. I, I, I want us to do this in part together um, because I, I want to know that when if I'm taking this much effort to bring our young people home and away from out-of-county facilities, I want to be responsible and making sure that they have the right transition when they come back into the school setting. That is the most critical time period, actually, mm -hmm. because that transition away from a place that felt, you know, like they could adapt to, back to the place where it's kind of chaotic and they're sort of falling through the cracks. Like, that is a very dangerous place for us, and if we are not on it, and we don't have, like, thousands of kids. Last time I checked, we had, like, 300. Is that right? 300, 400? 264 right. kids. So we can't, we got to track yes. 260 some kids yes. that are, you know, recently adjudicated, come back into school. We got to prove that what worked when they went away um, has to work when they come back in. And the partnership with the school district is particularly important. I think that they traditionally are left out of a lot of these conversations, which is a big problem for us because they are such a major part of a school and a child's life. Um, they know things that a lot of families don't know. They know things that a lot of, you know, us outside. Um, and so we do, I, I am very interested in working with you on that. And then, so, yeah, go ahead, please. Just one of the things that we do have in place is that we have actually a probation officer at the school district at their transitional center. And so every child that is sent to placement and is returning back into our communities, they are immediately referred to that probation officer who then coordinates with the school personnel to assure that transcripts are coming back from the residential placements and are actually are credited and the youth is actually placed in either their community school or an alternative school based upon the grades, based upon the curricula. Um, to assure that the kids are actually transitioning within 72 hours and assigned to a school within 72 hours. And so we've had success with in terms of that. Yeah. I just want to make sure. And is that new? Is that new? No, that that's been around for some time. Okay. Uh, that's been a process that's been around for some time. And, and it's, it's been working. Um, we've, we've decreased the number of kids in residential placements significantly yes, since about 2000. about in half. Since right. about 2005. I think there was a point where we had close to 2,000 kids for delinquency placements. And I mean, we're at an all time low with only 264. Granted, we need to get better at that, and we are getting better at that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we're looking for resources. That's why I think the evening reporting centers are so key, mm -hmm. because the second one that is being formed is being formed for the purposes of not sending kids to placements. But if we can get those things in place and offer those academic supports and system supports and things that we know that the child needs to progress well and transition 
uh, successfully out of probation supervision, then we've done our jobs in terms of having them become citizens mm -hmm. of this city. Who determines the placement of the young people in the particular high school? Is that left up to the school district, or is that something that you have any voice in? No, that is the school district who determines that. And then ha do you track, do you notice that some schools get concentrated with the number of young people uh, who return from placement? And I would have to get back to you on that in terms of school districts. Can you get back to me on statistics. the numbers with that? Yes. Because that would be helpful. Um, the second thing I would say is that the biggest complaint I hear from principals, while I appreciate um, the, you know, we want a efficient transition um, into a school setting because I think um, many of the young people, well, I'll say this. So we want a, we, we do want an efficient transition, but our experiences having spent 10 months on this task force has been that the educational programs within many of the residential uh, treatment facilities is far under par with zero oversight from the state. Um, you know this very well, that many of them sometimes don't have transcripts, that we struggle to get transcripts. We talk to young people who um, really see their transcripts and their uh, coursework fall through the cracks. I've witnessed quality like tr treatment centers where there's like a one room. There's, uh, there may be a, I, I'm, I'm guessing the teacher is certified, but there are probably six years transmitted between the number of kids who are there. There's no library, there's no textbook. They're on a computer, you know, for them to move into a, they're not going to a magnet school. Most of them are blocked from charter schools. They're landing at our neighborhood high schools. So they're landing in schools that are 600, 500, you know, way bigger than what they've been used to. Um, many of them have been decimated in terms of supports. Um, we have only just started, in September, we will have a social worker assigned to almost every single neighborhood high school. I think two of them are left out. Um, and that'll be the first time that we have a social worker assigned. The co complaint that I hear most often from principals who receive large numbers of kids, and you know, because of the school district, the way they tend to do things is they'll dump them in, you know, batches in, in certain schools. Um, you know, I know that they're trying to rethink that a little bit. But the principals feel bereft. So these kids come back, it's 72 hours, they're barely like getting their, you know, they're all like trying to figure out what's going on. Reuniting with family can be pretty traumatic too for them. Um, you know, they've been away, some of them have been in terrible settings, some, some of them have been harassed, beaten, because for God knows what, we don't even have state laws that prohibit those damn, those things. Um, and, you know, like, it, it is an issue. And so when they come back into the school setting within 72 hours, it's a pretty rapid transition. And the thing that I'm interested in, and I don't expect you to answer all of this, but I, I want my council colleagues and ourselves to talk with, um, with yourself, Mr. Castro uh, Jimenez, and your team, because I think that transition is a problem. It's, it's rapid, it's sudden, the principals feel unprepared. Um, they often are not made aware of ahead of time. I, obviously, there's privacy records that we have to be aware of, but we just have to be thoughtful that in our interest for efficient transition, um, it's not like they're landing at the most, uh, they're not landing at, the, at, at a school that is most outfitted to handle them. Sometimes they're landing in schools that are struggling to handle them, and those things can also compound upon each other. So um, two questions. One, can we meet? I mean, I would love for us to talk and meet. We have, a, we have a task force that's devoted to the residential treatment facilities. We have a set of, uh, you know, we have a series of recommendations. The school district is at the table. Um, you are not at the table, I don't believe, right? I don't think probation's at the table. I'm not at the table, but there is a court representative at the table that's that true. represents the court, yes. But we should keep a more, um, you, know, a, 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 you know, like a very active line of communication between us. Second, can I, um, could I have your testimony? I don't think it's, was it pre-printed for us? I don't think so. But if we can, if you could send it over to the chairman, that would be great. I will. Yeah, and I'll use that. And then third, um, could we, uh, could you just help me with that, that question? Where are the young people going? How many um, of them are coming back? Any other additional information that you think that we can be helpful? My interest is to help and facilitate the transition of these young people from treatment back into the school setting and back into child, youth, childhood, you know, 
um, whatever it is, you know, to make it as easy as possible. And it's an important issue, but I can say that um, most of the data that you're looking for, that's uh, uh, covered by the school district because they're the ones that actually place the child in school. Um, and assign a child within 72 hours. We're part of the process in terms of getting transcripts and ensuring that our kids are transitioning well, and we have okay. somebody there, but the school district is the one that makes that final decision. And so we can, we can reach out to the school district, let them know that you're seeking this information, but yes, they would be the owners of that yeah. record. And I, you know, I want you to know that the council, the, the chairman, myself, and other council members have really made those young people in residential treatment are a, one of our top priorities. We want them to know that we're looking out for them. We're trying to change the system, and we want to make it better, and you're going to, I know you're going to help us do that and figure that out with the school district in particular. So thank you very much. Thank you, chairman. Thank you. No, thank you, councilwoman, for sticking around. Councilman Curtis Jones, welcome back. So before we bring up um, individuals for public comment, Councilman Curtis Jones, do you have any questions for the panel? No, no I don't. Listen, I want to thank all three of you uh, for your testimony today as we roll up our sleeves and work collaboratively um, to address this issue of gun violence here in the city of Philadelphia. And I just want to thank you very much. Thank you. So in terms of public comment, I'm going to ask for um, Dr. Gregory Holston to please come on up, um, Sheriff Goodman to please come on up, and um, one other individual who has the interest um, in speaking to please come on up to the table. Thank you for uh, um, your time, uh, your interest in this matter. Um, as I stated before, and originally this was a um, hearing focusing on um, the works uh, and the strategies of the administration, but decided um, this morning, because individuals who also came said they wanted to speak um, for the record on this topic, that we will open it up. And so, um, but, but if you could also um, take in consideration between um, two to three minutes, um, and your remarks and your recommendations, um, feel free, but we'll be around. And I also recognize that all of you were here from 11 o'clock this morning. And so take your time as well. So we're not rushing, um, just speak as you need to as it relates to the public testimony com um, part of this hearing. And I'm gonna start with Ms. Sherrod Goodman. Just state your name and record and title for the record. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Shira Goodman. I'm the Executive Director of Ceasefire PA. We're a statewide gun violence prevention group. Our mission is to end the epidemic of gun violence across the Commonwealth and the country through education, coalition building, and advocacy. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, thank you for giving us this time. I, I know there were many people, survivors, victims, other community partners who, who wanted to have this opportunity, and so I would encourage you, um, but it's because it's only uh, uh, Councilman Jones and Councilman Johnson, I hope you all ask your colleagues. I think that they should hold these hearings in their own districts and hear from their, uh, the community, well, the good work that's going on there, what they need in terms of funding, what we need to do together. Um, clearly, Harrisburg and Washington are not coming to save Philadelphia. This is on us, all of us, it's on you. Um, Ceasefire Pennsylvania is fighting hard against uh, preemption and punitive preemption, trying to get more powers for cities like Philadelphia to pass their own ordinances, trying to protect Philadelphia when it takes those actions. But to solve this immediate crisis, this emergency will be on us. Um, you've heard about some of the things that um, I think are very important. The gun tracing initiative that the Attorney General's office spoke about is something we have been talking to the police and the mayor and city council and the Office of Violence Prevention and the governor about for a long time. So we're happy that that's going to happen. We need to know where these guns are coming from. And we need Philadelphia to be a leader on this in the state and to say, even if the state's not ready to do it, Philadelphia is to share that data, to get that data, and then to give us a report, to give you a report about where those guns are coming from, where they're moving, the zip codes that they're traveling between time from last legal purchase 
to crime distance from less legal purchase to crime. That will help you and Harrisburg develop better policies. Uh, the ghost guns I, I, that DA Krasner talked about, the plastic guns, um, they're not just plastic, they're metal, and you can buy parts, and New Jersey has now made them illegal, and so people are getting them shipped here to Pennsylvania. So once again, you know, this isn't just a Philadelphia problem. We have broad problems. We need money. We need to listen to the people. Um, in the last, you know, couple weeks, we've been talking to lots of folks. We've been working with power. My colleagues are here. We came last week to city council. Um, there were, the galleries were full of people who wanted to talk to you. So I do urge you to listen um, to your constituents because I think people on the ground who are suffering, who are afraid, who are coming up with creative solutions have, have really important things to say. One thing I have been asking for for a long time of the mayor and the Office of Violence Prevention is to convene us all together. You know, I know a lot of these folks, but there's people I meet for the first time every time. And Ceasefire PA, although we're a good partner, we don't necessarily have the convening power that city council or the mayor or the governor has to get everybody in a room. We can help with the logistics afterwards. We can help with the follow-up. But we need your, your juice, as it were, to get people in that room. Um, you know, we're a good partner. We don't get money from the city or the state or the feds, so we're not competing with these folks. We just want to support each other and do that. Um, but Philadelphia is definitely hurting. Um, where we've seen a lot of pain, we're seeing people come out, um, and people took a lot of time off to be here today. So I think it's important to hear from the police chief and the DA and the attorney general and all the folks you heard from, but I think that council people need to hear from their constituents. And um, so I'd urge you to hold those hearings um, and meetings in your districts. And I know that some of our legislators who are coming back are fighting for these things, but you know, they, they are doing other fights now too. The budget that's gonna hurt Philadelphia and the people who are suffering is not gonna help the neighborhoods that are suffering already. Um, and we're gonna fight that. And we're gonna fight the effort to put more guns in our schools, which is going on again right now. So we have a lot, we're fighting on a lot of fronts. Um, we wanna be there for all of that. Um, and we think we have a lot more work to do and we are in a crisis. So thank you for recognizing that and we hope that we'll continue to have these opportunities. Thank you. Just please state your name. Hi, Reverend, Reverend. Jeanette Davis. Um, I just want to say thank you, Councilman Johnson and Councilman Jones, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. We have been here all day, and a lot of things that I had um, in my notes, you guys have already went over. But I'm going to be brief because of time. Take your time. Uh, yeah. So um, my name is Reverend Jeanette Davis. I am the um, director of Diva's Ministry Group and the President. I also sit on Powers Clergy Caucus. And I'm here today to advocate on behalf of community members, residents, um, myself, and we're outraged at the increase of the gun violence in our city and the lack of attention that it received up until recently. There are so many issues focused on in our society that we have now lost perspective to the importance of humanity and that human life is God's creation and there should be no other focus or priority that should come first um, in precedence. This should oversee all plans, projects, or initiatives, hu human life. So we're here today to request for three things. One, which would be accountability, the other, immediate action, and change. The accountability of to whom which is given, whom much is required. As city officials, you know, you guys have taken the oath to serve God's people and his public servants to ensure that the city's residents and taxpaying constituents are able to reside in a safe and healthy community. We have, we, we've listened to the idle talk. We've, we've sat in countless unproductive meetings. We've marched, we've rallied, y you know, we've protested. And yet somehow we wind up still here, right here with no real concrete solutions. So the, um, I'm coming from a Christian standpoint and the Bible declares that faith without works is dead. And that's exactly what we're seeing across our city, death. And, Jesus already paid the price and died on the cross and bled on the cross. So the residents of Philadelphia shouldn't have to do that. 
So I, I'm just really upset here, and I want to go over the, um, the, the, the change that we need. We need to start invest, investing the resources in people instead of initiatives and projects. I, I, I think that's where we're missing the mark. The investment should go to our schools, our jobs, housing, health care, and human rights that have proven to address the causes of violence. In the process of creating change, we need to recognize the community nonprofit organization because they are truly the heartbeat of the community. They can reach, they interact. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations who are actually on the ground doing the work. They never get the recognition. They don't get proper funding. So th th this is a problem. And if we want to talk about how we correct the wrong, I think we should go in the direction where we get these resources out into the community through these community organizations. Now, the research has proven that every 10 additional organizations focusing on violence and community life in a city with 100,000 residents leads to a 9% reduction in the murder rate and a 6% reduction in the violent crime rate and a 4% reduction in the property crime rate. So as it opposes to immediate action, I believe that we can immediately start targeting Philadelphia's five zip codes with the highest rates of gun violence with additional resources, the funding that I keep referring to. Um, we can immediately, immediately start by the revision and the implementation of new policies and initiatives. You know, uh, last week, there was a bishop who did the opening prayer for last Thursday's event, and what he said when he opened up, if we keep doing the same old things the same old way, we will keep getting the same results. So I, I, I just believe that it's, it's time for us, in order for us to create change, as I said, that we have to start looking at this thing from a different perspective. We, we have to start doing things that we normally wouldn't do and focus on people in community, and I'm not saying that you haven't been because I've actually been to your district, our organization has been to your district affairs. And so I, I know your heart and, and, and your motive about people and community. I know your love for that. So I'm just asking here today that um, if you could um, express this to the rest of the council, President D Darryl Clark, the, the rest of the city council, I really want them to be able to hear the people. It's the people who we need to listen to because these are the people who entrusted and believed in you enough and gave you the votes to be in this position. So I, I in, in closing, I wanna say that we need to begin to open the rec centers and increase extended hours for our youth by creating guaranteed summer employment for our youth and offering counseling, conflict resolution, meditation around the clock. And in closing, I also want to add, uh, I, I really want to know where the church is in all this. I, I, because I, I, it's not a you problem, it's not a me problem, it's a we problem. So we, the church, we have a responsibility as well. So that's one of my questions as to where the church is. And in stating that, I am the ministerial aide on behalf of Archbishop Mary Floyd Palmer. And uh, Philadelphia Council Clergy stands in solidarity along with Power and the other alliance, Ceasefire, um, the 30 Elite Club, we, we, we're all in alliance together. She stands in solidarity and what she wishes to do is to implement an initiative called the Healing Project. And we all know that her father, Dr. Melvin Floyd, he's been fighting gun violence for decades. So yes, yeah, so she wishes to implement this and uh, be a part of the alliance and the coalition. And in closing, I'm just going to read this from 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal the land. I thank you very much for hearing my testimony.
Good afternoon now. Uh, we started this morning, like y'all said, Arnett Woodall, community scholar, University of Penn, owner and builder of West Philadelphia Produce, CEO of a &W Community Solutions, and also the CEO of the West Market Street Improvement Association. Uh, my work has worked for most of you. Matter of fact, Councilman Kenyatta Johnson used to live on 53rd and Lebanon for a brief time. Yeah, my youth group that still works in the city of Philadelphia used to cut your grass because yeah, the youth. My sister, yeah. Your sister house, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So before you were counseling. I remember now. My yeah. programs ran across this city and still run across this city from North Philly all the way across. I, I used to be a teacher aide disciplinarian in the juvenile prison system. I ran the vocations. I created the on grounds work program for the juvenile probation, for the juvenile prison system. I left the prison system in 2001 and started a &W Community Solutions to hire the youth across the city of Philadelphia. And since 2001, I have been doing just that. I don't need to tell you more, but West Philadelphia Produce is built on a drug lot in West Philadelphia where all your heroin, crack, and coke, your hottest area in West Philadelphia in 2002. When Delaware County built a shelter on 63rd and Market Street, the Life Center, all of the opioid addicted people from Delaware County moved to West Philadelphia. That supply and demand brought needles and everything right to West Philadelphia on a lot that's been open now for 10 years, run by the youth in the community from across the city of Philadelphia. John Jay University, the number one criminal justice university on the planet, has deemed us the model for all communities across the country because it's the only model that they see to have the youth built into the economics. Right now, your pan group that just got finished testifying, they're at West Philadelphia Produce working right now. And they're on the West Market Street corridor cleaning up your area and the Councilwoman Blackwell's area under the West Philadelphia Community Clean Team, which has been up and operating now for 10 years, funded by myself, $1.8 million out of pocket on my programs, unable to get any grants or any support or any help from City Hall yet. Three weeks ago, you just saw a mother and child shielded in a gun battle in West Philadelphia at 1.30 in the afternoon, where you see a store owner that's shielded. Go to Fox News, Google anything I'm telling you, because I'm going to give you a bunch of links. Matter of fact, I'd like somebody to pass this up to the councilman right now, because my Town Watch organization has been running for 15 years, you introduce this councilman, Curtis Jones. My town watch gets funded zero dollars, and the paper that these town watch, this all I get for town watch, is a piece of paper. We're to support it for the people in the communities. You're going to push community policing through the police department, and I wish they were here so that they could hear this, because your community policing is called community policing for one reason and one reason only. Community policing is done by the community, and you're not empowering your community to help in this situation. And by keep empowering the police officers to do singing in the community and dancing in the community and playing football in the community is not community policing. Community policing can only be done by the community, and that's why it's called community policing. So you can stop, everyone can stop playing that game with us talking about community policing. You're not training the community for one, on how to avert being shot in the crossfires. This is a 40 caliber bullet that y'all CSI crew left at my scene when I just saved that mother and daughter from that shootout. One had his 45 caliber automatic weapon, the other one had a 40 caliber automatic weapon, and yes, I laid there on top of them in front of them so they could not be shot. Google Fox News. Also Google 10-year-old steals van. What you need across the city of Philadelphia in these hot spots and in these hot pockets, I've only been telling y'all forever. Councilwoman to tell you, she's given me plenty of recommendations. I always miss it by one vote getting any help or any support. I just put in for four of those paying grants. I didn't get a nickel, but I got all their kids. They at my store right now, they're doing district services. I created the West Market Street Improvement Association to show you anywhere in any underserved community, the money's sitting right in the Commerce Department to help create these jobs. Your ROCs, registered community organizations, have to do better community 
agreements with the community to create these jobs. That's where the money is. You got to create self-sustainable projects that you don't have to keep coming back and begging and asking for money for people. None of your programs are self-sustaining. All of your programs right now only last two to three to six weeks. We just bragged and had a press conference talking about 8,000 jobs that's getting ready to come to the city for the youth across the city. They only last for six weeks. That's not enough. And it's not going to be enough until we create more opportunity for people. One way to do it is by revamping your RCOs. When y'all come back, the community agreements need to be done different. Because those businesses that are moving in our communities, that are getting these tax abatements and not paying no taxes or anything like that, that money belongs our, on our streets, cleaning our communities, providing safety in our communities. Town Watch needs to be funded. If you want to start talking about the crime and the violence, why don't y'all just fund Town Watch? Why does Town Watch do nothing but get pieces of paper out? What am I supposed to do with this piece of paper? Throw it up and ball it at the, and throw it at the criminals? We're out there, boots on the ground. I need bikes, I need flashlights, I need walkie-talkies, I need funding, the same funding I've been asking y'all for. Councilwoman has set up many, many meetings for me to sit with most of you. And in those meetings, I got SEPTA there, I got the Commerce Department there. Everything that we ask for, we've got nothing. I need to know where the money at and where the real organizations that's out there doing the work are gonna get some support. My name is Arnett Woodall, you can reach me at Arnett Woodall at West Philadelphia Produce, at Arnett Woodall on Instagram, Arnett Woodall for mayor. This year I'm running for mayor right now because I, one way or another somebody got to fix it. And if I can't work with you, you will work for me. I will run until I am elected to fix this situation. West Philadelphia Produce is teaching community hubs. Everyone in your community that are, have these spikes in crime need a community hub in it. If I rob you right now, if you out on the street, you can't, ain't a phone booth in the community for you to go to. Where do your community go to if you get robbed on the street? And I take your phone. You can't call the police. You can't go nowhere. You won't have a public bathroom or none of your commercial corridors for a senior citizen, for a child, for a person to use. You put it in your community hub. My town watch runs out of my community hub. My community clean team runs out of my community hub. Your community needs support. They don't need 500 enforcement officers. Right now, what your city doesn't need is more enforcement. It needs more support and more help. And we looking for y'all. I don't even know how we going on a break with this spike in crime. We all get ready to go on a break. How are we going on a break? We need to be in a think tank right now. You put me in a room with some of your smartest people and I can help you. I'm only a scholar on communities and I've only been doing this my whole life. 16 years in the prison, not as a returned citizen, I was the teacher in there. I was the educator in the system. And I've been trying to educate y'all on what needs to be done. When I used to, my children used to cut your grass councilman, you used to, I used to let you put the money. When you would come to your sister's door, I would used to send the youth so you put the money in their hand. They need job opportunities where people are showing them that their life is worth something and putting money in their hand and bringing them resources to create jobs. West Philadelphia Produce is teaching them how to be calling their art chefs. My son, I just let leave the city of Philadelphia because of the violence. My son is now in Dallas, Texas, running a Marriott and working inside Response Network Center. You gotta be teaching Narcan, gotta be coming out of your, um, out of your community hubs, your first aid training, your first responders are your community, as you see from right there from that resolution that I just shared with you. Also in that packet is a group of links. That ain't even all the links. I've been on the cover of every one of your newspapers on Good Morning America, ABC, NBC, not supported by y'all, but y'all gotta start supporting the people that's out there that's boots on the ground, and you need to do it immediately. Lives can be saved. Thank you very much. Reverend Greg Holstein. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Reverend Gregory Holstein, the Executive Director of Power. Power is uh, now 83 congregations plus another 40 congregations uh, across the city of Philadelphia, the surrounding counties, and now organizing in the middle of the state, building communities of opportunity that work for all. We are a part of a national organization called Faith in Action. 
uh, which has 46 affiliates just like us in about 22 states across the nation representing 2.2 million people. I bring them up today, I newly don't mention the national group, is because our national Live Free uh, campaign, which is about criminal justice reform, uh, ending mass incarceration, uh, police accountability, and ending gun violence, has had a great deal of success um, across the nation, uh, bringing faith people, faith communities together, along with uh, anti-gun violence organizations, along with uh, the whole community, in reducing gun violence. The uh, report that you read, uh, Councilman, uh, from Oakland is our is a leader of our Live Free team, uh, Reverend uh, Michael McBride, who is a great expert in this issue, as well as our connections, uh, uh, a reduction of 50% in Oakland, uh, similar reduction in Indianapolis, uh, similar reductions in New York City with the uh, Black Consortium of Leaders Around Gun Violence, and across the nation, we've had good results. I, I, one of the things that Reverend Bride says, first of all, is to recognize that the black community is not a violent community. The black community uh, is, by most part, most people are not engaged in violence at all. Only about 0.5%, half of a percent, of the people in the black community are engaged in any violent activity. So I say that because we, we, we present these images and everybody thinks everybody in the black community is always out shooting somebody and that's just not been the case. And so there's about 700,000 black folk in Philadelphia. 0.5% is about 3,500 people, normally mostly young people, mostly males, uh, that are involved in this gun violence. 3,500 people, all right? And so if we recognize that we're talking about mainly 3,500 people that, that are involved in these activities that are they're causing tens of thousands of people to feel uncomfortable or afraid in their own communities, that if we do some real intervention for those 3,500 people, then we can make real change in dealing with the violence in our communities. Um, so to put somebody in prison which is those 3,500 people, we had a whole police force here today, that's their job, put the 3,500 people in prison, costs about $45,000 a year for each individual. So if you lock all of them up and put all of them in jail, it would cost about $140 million to house them for a year. So I say you got everybody off the street that was involved in violence at all, it's about $140 million you would spend. If you intervene beforehand and spend some, you, if you spend, the statistics say, uh, and Reverend McBride is very good at this, if you spend somewhere like on twenty-five dollars to $30,000 for each of those individuals, that's how, if they, that's the intervention that could transform and change their lives, or can bring them into job opportunities, career opportunities, build a better community and build better people out of that 3,500 folk, that's going to cost somewhere around $90 million to do that. Now, so we put all our money in policing, and we think that's going to make us safe, but police can't make us safe. Our idea of understanding what public safety is has to be a broader concept than what the police or the district attorney does. To hear this testimony today and recognize that most of the time was spent on talking about what the DA thinks and what the police think, when they really are not the drivers of creating real public safety in our community. We have a third arm, and that third arm we do not spend enough money on. The third arm of those anti-gun violence organizations, those health organizations that intervene in the lives of people and really can move that 3,500 people into better lives and out of violence. And so we only spend $6 million on them when we should be spending about $90 million. So our scope and our vision of what we need to do is entirely too small. And I, would, I said this to even, our, you know, Emir, Every Murder is Real, uh, is in my church. I mean, they are housed in my church. 
uh, the church that I pastor. Uh, and I've said to them, I said, you know, your work is great. 500 families every year, uh, they're the victims of gun violence, come through their doors, and they service them in a variety of different ways. But I always say to them, your vision's too small. To really deal with this problem, you need to be a lot bigger than this. You need to have hubs all across this city. You need whatever you're doing at my church, you need to be doing at 20, 25, 30 churches the same kind of way. Your vision is not big enough for the, with the magnitude of the problem that's faced. And so, and so when I'm saying to even to anti-gun violence folk, you, your vision is that small because the budget has been reduced so much you're not even dreaming big enough to really solve the problem. And so, so you as council people got to have a bigger vision as well. You, you know, everyone talks about that uh, Mayor Nutter in 2008 cut the budget for a lot of these programs and the money never really got put in by, by Kenny back again. But the reality is the budget ain't never been big enough to deal with the gun violence in our community, to deal with the needs of our community. And so instead of playing it on prisons, and on jail, which costing us 140 million, it makes more sense to take that money and, and which D.A. Kraus is basically trying to do, he's trying to reduce the prison population so we can take that money and put it into intervention beforehand. We need to up our game a great deal. We need to spend a lot more money than we're spending. And until we, you know, the figure of $700,000, quite frankly, was laughable. That you given that out to these groups, that was laughable. To even bring that number up and suggest that somehow we can solve that problem for $700,000 was just ridiculous. But yet no one even looked at it as ridiculous. People didn't say it was ridiculous. No, we need to lease, uh, we need at least a $10 million infusion right now. This is an emergency right now. These groups are on the ground. E people like Emir have a hub program that they want to put in place. Give them the $2 million that they want to use right now to put that hub program in place and make that happen right now. Get that 10 million on the street right now. If we're really serious about this being emergency and children are shooting up graduation parties and proms and all of this stuff is going on, we need at least 10 million on the street right now this summer to be able to solve the problem, to get some of these 3,500 people that everyone has already identified and know who they are. They know who they are. The police know who they are. Everybody know who they are. So if you know who they are, instead of stopping and frisking them and trying to harass them and doing special uh, uh, pinpoint operations to deal with them, you need to go up and talk to them and say, hey, I need to get you a job and get you a better life. I got a program right now that's going to help you do that. Will you stop shooting people if we can get you in this program? Man, it's... This is not rock and science. Sister Fatah was doing this in the 1970s with no money, but now we need some real money to do this in 2019. I'm looking for this council to step up and have a special session and find $10 million to put on the street this summer. Not, and not wait two weeks and have a meeting July 25th where the, where the uh, summer's already gone. I'm talking about 48 hours, give me $10 million on the street, get in the hands of mothers in charge, get in the hands of Emir, get in the hands of Charles Fountain, get it in the hands of the folk who know how to do this problem and get it in their hands right now so we can start dealing right now on the street. Why can't this city council do that? I was told we got $360 million in a rainy day fund. Well, if this ain't a rainy day when they shooting up graduations, I don't know what is. Sometimes the simple assertion of the truth is, is, is what you need. Um, and what I heard from you today is something that uh, me and my colleagues have been vexed with and in those quiet meetings when the cameras aren't on, uh, we raise the issue um, of, of these kinds of, of appropriations. We um, were able to, uh, a couple of years ago, close a prison. 
And, we, yeah. and I wanted to tell you what, and thank you, because one of your presentations right across the hall, you showed a $1 million block where we spent a $1 million to over-incarcerate, prosecute, arrest, one block. And, and that statistic never left my head. So when we fought to close that prison, now that's about somewhere between a $12 million and $14 million savings a year that needs to be appropriated towards these efforts. So um, I'm going to take you up. I don't know about a special session of council, but we can get a special session with the mayor uh, to talk about this kind of appropriation. Uh, and I'm willing uh, to do that. Thank, thank, so th I mean. no, thank you. Thank you. Virginia is doing a special session of the legislature. You know, the governor called them in after the recent shooting in Virginia Beach. So, you know, I, I want to echo um, Pastor Greg and say, if you called a special session at council, I, I think people would be motivated and inspired and ready to fight with you. It, it, and and I'm, I, I would say this strongly to you because I believe in you. I believe in you. Uh, uh, especially Councilman Kenyatta, I know your efforts on gun violence and, and also uh, uh, Councilman Jones. I know how deeply y'all care about this. And I'm like, let's step up, man. <laughs> this is leadership time. This leaders say, this is emergency. We need to meet. We need to prove this. We need to move this forward. That's what it's all about. And there's some moments in times you gotta grab it. Look, man, they shot up a graduation. I mean, nobody does, not even, even as bad as it was in the 70s when I was growing up, nobody shot up a graduation party. Nobody would dare, there was some stuff that you took, you, you just didn't do. Proms and graduations, you, you didn't touch those. Church, you didn't touch them. But now they're touching them. And look what, look what Ross said, look what Commissioner Ross said. Man, they were in the block, all the cops were there, and half down the street, they pulled up and shot somebody else? Man, come on, man, this, this is crazy out here. And we gotta respond like it is an emergency, and it is, and this kind of appropriation in the hands of folk who've already proven their work. You ain't gotta go back through. Everybody knows what the mothers in charge have done. Then you've seen in mirrors where y'all know what they've done. So go ahead and fund the folk and help support them with all the administrative help that they need to make sure that all that money is administered in the right way. Give them the f fiscal support that they need so they can go out on the street and do what's necessary. Thank you. Yes, okay. so we're going to do this uh, first. I, I'm from just, California. Just before you start, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Any, any other questions for the media panel? Okay, no. we're going to call up our next individual panelist. Thank you very much for your testimony. Appreciate okay. it. Just one second, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else here to testify? Please come to the microphone. Please state your name um, for the record, please. My name is Wendy Simonson, and I'm an educator from California. I moved out here because my son and his, his wife split up, so I help with the grandkids. I cannot believe that Philadelphia has high schools that are rated at a one and a two. That's criminal, yet you spend a fortune on your prisons. I always taught at-risk kids at the high school level. I've run peer tutoring programs at a high school, at a community college, I mean at a, a community, middle school and elementary schools. I've trained third to fifth graders to tutor each other. It is just as easy to teach a kid to read as it is to teach a kid to walk. There's no excuse for it. These kids are not stupid. If, if you, there are no learning centers at almost every school in this district. Every school should have a learning center. All these kids are capable of learning you don't have to label them and put them in special ed just because they're like two years behind in reading, writing, study skills, or math. That's, that's not necessary. Once they have basic skills, they can do any job. You don't have a lot of the, um, the basic programs like becoming a plumber, becoming a mechanic, becoming all these other skills that we used to have when I was in school. You could take those programs. Those aren't all available. When I taught high school, I taught independent study for all the pregnant girls and young mothers and kids that had to work. Well, a girl that's 13 years old is not really ready to have a child. 
in my high school district, they only taught abstinence. Just don't have sex. Well, we had the highest teenage pregnancy rate in the entire nation when I was working in the school district teaching pregnant girls. I don't know what you do for your sex education in this area, but that's also a huge area that needs to be addressed because it's hard enough to be a mother. I was 29 as a first mother. It's hard enough to be a mother when you're college educated, married, and have a good job. So anyway, every school should have a learning center. All these things that they've talked about all need to happen. You don't need a million police frisking everybody all over the place. You don't have to have people's cars being taken because they can't pay a parking ticket. You guys make a fortune on taking people's vehicles because they can't pay to get them back. Well, I knew a lot of people in California that lost their cars because they couldn't pay the parking tickets that they had. That, you have to take 10,000 cars a year in Philadelphia. Is that really helping people? That's not helping anybody. Why do you do that? It's not fair. So anyway, do something about the schools. A learning center in every single school put the money in the schools, and don't allow the teachers to yell at the kids. Thank teachers you, should not yell at children. Well, no, that's and there should be a consequence. If you're a child at a high school and you keep getting referrals and you keep bullying people, there needs to be a record of that. I called my school district, I called my police station when I stopped teaching in my district. I said, I know this particular young man. He is going to cause crime. He's going to kill people. Oh, we, don't, we can't do anything until he does something. Well, he's done plenty at the high school. Why are those records not forwarded to the police department? Why do they do? There's no consequence. There's no consequence. I was on jury duty. They spent all this time asking us a million questions. If they spent even five minutes like that when the kid's in high school, he wouldn't be, we wouldn't be at jury duty with the kid. Okay. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insight. Thank you. Hello. My name is Charlotte Greer Brown and I'm a community advocate, youth advocate, community activist, whatever you want to call yourself. I just know that I'm a concerned citizen. Uh, before I begin, oh, and I also have an organization called uh, the Elite 30 Association and Coalition. But I just wanted to say something that was very vital for the record. Uh, I don't think those type of things should be filtered down to a police department with those uh, different issues. There should be an intervention or somewhere, a cool out time or somewhere who's professional that can handle that or, or people who they can just recognize and identify with. We can't keep pushing things to the police system. But I'm here to speak from the grassroots perspective. Uh, on the grounds uh, where Facebook Live and social media and cameras are, are not there, where there are people who are risking their lives to uh, pull over and intervene in situations where there may be a shootout or a, a boyfriend or a, a male choking a female. These are things that I have been seeing lately where there are people who's been intervening. And with this coalition that I have, the Elite 30 Association Coalition, there are 55 small businesses, organizations, and nonprofits who have come together over the past three years to make a difference collectively. We may have different mission statements, but we do understand the importance of coming together. I, I look at the faces here since I've been here since 11 something, and people are so nonchalant. And it's easy to be that way when you're not in the community, you don't hear the gunshots. Uh, just the other day, I was off of Allegheny near Clearfield, no, off of Broad near Clearfield at the KFC, and I went back to get some change. And two seconds, I can, I can hear it right, not, not far from me. And I was grabbing my change out the window, and I heard pow, pow, pow. So for me, being a uh, 39th Police District Advisory Council member, 22nd Police District Advisory Council member, a Town Watch member, DA Youth A panelist, I mean, I can just go on. I have involved myself in all these different areas so that I can be able to be well-rounded. And to, 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 to know all of that and have all of that, to hear all of that, and, and not be able to uh, pinpoint or have answers from those type of things that happen, we, we know that the community needs support, but we also know that it's a situation where those groups that come together to understand what the need is. So you can ask police officers, you can ask different people, but you have to ask people who are on the grounds. 
And I, I gave you a card, you know, uh, uh, Councilman uh, Kenyatta, and I gave a card to Ms. Vanessa recently so that we can collab collaborate with those nonprofits, small business and or organizations who decided to come together. Yes, I'm all for police and I'm all for town watching. I, I'm all for that. I'm all for building, gra uh, building gaps and bridges. I mean, we've been saying these same things over and over again. But when you get a phone call at 2 o'clock in the morning when somebody needs somewhere to stay, live, eat, I'm one of those people who people call. Now, yes, I used to work for the state. I was a community outreach person. So I understand the structure that needs to go around connecting. But your grassroots people are really the people who know what's going on. It's like we keep asking asking all these other individuals who are not there. Academia has nothing to do with experience. And right now, I can give you a whole list of things that I've participated in, academia, everything, but that has nothing to do with the fact that I've been on the ground and I had the chance to hear what these people are saying. Yesterday, we gathered over uh, 70 young people at Forget Me Not Youth Services at 2321 North Broad Street to come out and hear the late GOAT, great of all time, Muhammad Ali's uh, oldest daughter, Miriam Ali, to hear her empower them. But we have people like Miriam Ali in our community who can come and tell you, listen, I did A, B, and C, and now this is where my life is. So we have to use the people that are around. So I'm here to speak on behalf of the grassroots organizations. And as I mentioned before, there are several coalitions who come together, because that's your pool. You don't have to go looking and searching Google on internet and looking for the nonprofits that are, are effective in small business organizations. You already have them working together. So I think you should start there. And uh, the reason I brought up the nonchalant phases, this is a crisis. And I bet you right now on one of my notifications, once my phone come back on, I'm probably going to see something about a shooting. So we have to take it more seriously. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Gabriel Homan. Uh, I'm just a citizen of Philadelphia. But I've, I've lived here my, my whole life, you know, from East Falls to South Philly to West Philly now. And... I've had to move and I've got kicked out of my house and you know moved around but in the past week or two I've heard more shootings in the past like happen in my neighborhood than than ever and I don't know why or what is exactly going on in people's minds maybe Trump and a bunny are just like going at it right but like who cares because Philadelphia is Philadelphia and we got to keep ourselves safe and we have our own home that we have to keep you know, this is our homeland. And I appreciate both of you for being the two city council members who've sat here the whole time listening to us, the citizenry, and everyone else that has been here. You know, that come and gone. I, I was here a couple hours ago, but it's a lot emptier. But thank you, first of all. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, is there anyone else here to testify on this bill? So before, before you leave, a couple of things. Um, one, I want to take you up on that grassroot uh, issue. I know in my part of town, I'd love to be connected more with grassroot organizations that have boots on the ground. But I want you to also know, I get them same calls right. at two in the morning mm -hmm. about somebody who is either homeless, someone, some act of violence that is about to go down, or those kinds of things. So trust and believe in, we commiserate together. Right. Um, when we watch the news, we watch it differently. We, we watch, first, we pray for the soul that might be taken. The second thing I do is the geography of where it was taken. I said, was that Kenyatta's area? Was that Councilwoman Blackwell's area? And it weighs on us in that regard. So I want you to understand, we want a sincere, connected partnership in resolving this. When we sit here, we hear it all the time, but we affected by it too. When I was 16 years old, I was walking to, you won't know what this is, it was a social, maybe Pastor might know because he mentioned the 70s, and in, in my neighborhood, someone came out of a driveway, shot into the crowd, and killed the young lady I was with. This is not academic for me. Right. This is, in, and which is worse, and I did the um, piece with Sister Falaka on their documentary, is generational. The worst thing that happened was that young lady died. 20, 30 years later, I'm in office. I'm in office, I go to a shooting at Tustin. Mm -hmm. I look through the crowd about 
the young person that was killed, and who is the parent of the person? The sister of the one that was killed. It's generation. Yes. And so we, this, this, and, and somebody said, if we don't want to be here talking about this a decade from now, right. we need to do something different. Right. So that difference is this connectivity with people who may be able to do what Pastor said and get the mayor to commit some more resources. But also, we have to have the baskets to put it in that are effective that we can measure those results with. Number one, I'm not one of those people that get up and speak, although I can hold my ground and, and, pe and yes, speak publicly. I'm a, you gotta understand, I'm a behind the scenes worker. You know, and I make things happen. That's my, I made the, my middle name, I make things happen. Because we have, to be, we have to understand it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about any of us. What we're doing is we're, we're providing human service to the community. And when I speak, I don't just speak from, from me, I'm speaking for the other individuals who were here, who left. Uh, Reverend Jeanette Davis and I, and we all are partners, Philadelphia Ceasefire, PA Ceasefire, all of us are partners and we come together. So you had 60 leaders almost here today that's the head of these organization, organizations that I'm telling you about over the past three years who decided to come together and work together. But what I'm saying to you is that, you know, I'm not the only person that get those phone calls, they do too. And what's beautifully happening that you probably are not seeing on social media, we have taken over this thing. I mean, I can tell you if, you, if you go and request to be my friend right now, almost everybody you probably know, affiliated with, from elected officials to grassroots, is right there. I mean, even the people behind me, we all have the same network. We just needed to learn how to use it, but we've used it on social media platform. And just to wrap it up, we have been able to say, such and such need help. If I'm not able to do it, I tag the individuals that are able to do it. So we have to take that tool on social media and bring it into reality. So all I'm saying in closing, I want to be your friend. Okay. So let's, let's make right. it happen. We, we need right. to work together. All right. Thank you. This concludes our witnesses for today. This hearing will stand in recess to the call of the chair. I just want to thank everyone who stuck it out. Um, we start at 11. 11. It's 4, um, but this isn't the first time um, that we've done the same type of hearing on gun violence. We've done a couple years ago when it lasted for the same period of time. It was very serious. So we're going to take this information back and look at how we continuously um, step up to the plate to address this issue of youth come Thank you very much.